We do the lightning round again? I don't see why not. I suppose we could I probably do I am more interested in talking to callers than I am. I would rather talk to random strangers in the middle of the night to talk about impact. I didn't alert people that we were going to have a lightning round, so we'll probably have even even fewer callers than ever. Maybe I'll, I'll put on the board that the lightning round is going to start soon. Why don't you do that? Why don't you start on impact, and I'll get this thing ready. Impact opened with Bischoff, his entire crew coming out. There was 14 men out there. He started talking about bounties and... Lawyers and judges, and this took like two minutes. I have no idea what he was talking about. He started calling out the champions who would be defending their titles against the uh, Immortal Crew on Sunday. So, Lethal came down. He was very tentative. And Eric said, you, I promise you, you won this whole show here with millions of people watching and millions of witnesses. I don't want to get in trouble. I promise you will be safe. So, he got in the ring. And the machine guns came down, and Doug Williams came down. So, Bischoff then said that there were not going to be any shenanigans. They were just going to have a bunch of great matches at the pay-per-view. He had to announce this. This is news. That TNA is only going to have a bunch of good matches. And he said he wanted them to have two-up matches tonight. So, he booked Jay Lethal versus Abyss, Doug Williams versus Rob Terry, and the Machine Guns versus AJ and Kazarian. And then Immortal attacked them and beat them all up. So, the good guys look like complete fools here. And then RVD by himself ran down to make the save. He turned the tide against the entire army. Uh, then the segment was not over. Rob demanded to know who his opponent over the pay-per-view was. Eric said no. Rob said, come on, tell me, and then it ended. Yeah, this was... Uh, it went on forever. It did. That was that was my big issue. It, it went on forever to establish nothing. It was, like, it was like one of those... I mean, obviously, when you're when you're taping four weeks of TV in four days, eventually you just get to the point, especially on the fourth show, where it's like, we can just waste some fucking time. This came off as like a big waste of time. The baby faces look like complete morons. They believe Bischoff, they got beat up, just like complete idiots. At least Rob Van Dam beat up all of the guys by himself like a true baby face would. And my only other question, which is, is uh, granted, kind of a nitpick, though, is... Why is Rob Van Dam so concerned about who his opponent is on Sunday? Because it seems to me that on every television show we've ever seen with TNA, dudes arrive in the afternoon or late, and they usually don't know their opponent until sometimes shortly before they go to the ring. Yes. So what the fuck difference does it make if he doesn't know his opponent is on Sunday? It's not like most TD matches are preceded by three-month contract signings. I mean, is Rob Van Dam a guy that historically has watched tapes and scouted opponents? Maybe that's it. I don't think so. Maybe he wants to adjust his style. A hmm. uh, short clip of Bubba Ray calling out Devon. He wanted to fight him in the parking lot tonight. Jared came out. He said that for the uh, double J, double MA challenge, he would only face men his height or shorter because he didn't want anyone to get seriously hurt. He also announced that it is now just an exhibition. No more real competitions because, again, he doesn't want anyone to get seriously hurt. So there was an actor from the Twilight movies there. He was 14. Jarrett T's fighting him, but then it turns out the kid's dad's tall. So Jarrett said, one day you will be taller than me. I won't fight you. I like how the, the guy, this young fella, was supposedly in the Junior Black Belt Hall of Fame. I should actually Google that. I can't imagine that such a thing actually exists. Maybe it does. I don't know. But, uh, Let's find out. Jarrett then started saying something about how we... I I'd, I'd wish I in hindsight I wish I made you rewind. By the time I didn't care that much. He said something along the lines of "We want real competition," or "I'm looking for competition." But he said this two minutes after he said there would be no more competitions. So a man named Jonathan Cruz came in to accept the non-competition challenge, and as they were talking, Jeff suddenly pounced on him and destroyed him and beat him up. This is awesome. Every reference to the Junior Black Belt Hall of Fame that comes up in Google is a reference to Impact last night. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Boo Boo Stewart here is the name from uh, this fellow from Twilight. Although, the top thing is Rising Sun Karate Incorporated. Well, Somebody here apparently is supposedly... Let's find out who it is. Maybe it is this same fella. Let me uh, let me find out. You keep going there. Oh, actually, then when I open the page, that that uh, is nowhere to be found. 
Hmm. So we had our, what seemed like the 400th segment of Jeff Jarrett beating up a plant. Do you feel that this is lost on me? Sensei Kyle. Kyle? Second degree black belt. He began, he doesn't have a last name apparently. Uh, began studying karate in 1998 at the age of four. Shortly thereafter, entered the competitive arena. In January 1999, he won first place in musical forms at the USA Nationals. The LA Open in March, he won the coveted Grand Champion Trophy, earned his first black belt in September 2003. So that would have been five years training. He would have been nine. And then in December 2004, he was inducted into the Junior Black Belt Hall of Fame. So yes, nine-year-old black belts, everybody. In musical forms. I'd kick that kid's ass. I won't lie. Your cats would kick that kid's ass. I go on. Yeah, so uh, Jeff beat this guy up. Uh, like I said, we've seen this 400 times by now. Appeal is lo- the appeal is lost on me. Angle- Actually, let me let me say this. I'll be fair here. I, I if I'm going to say this about Dragon Gate USA, it's only fair to say it about TNA. If you if you can accept what this is, which in TNA's coincidence or it, TNA's instance is a, a case of these people have no idea what they're doing and can't decide whether Jared is a shooter or he's a, a coward. And apparently they've they've decided that now he's a coward. Fine. If you accept that that's the case, he actually doesn't know a goddamn thing about MMA and he's a coward, then I enjoyed this segment. And uh, he, he did have some very fake-looking jujitsu. Well, of course. Or, sure. Yes. So. But, I mean, again, we go back to the whole deal of the idea that all of these fans are begging to get into the ring to beat this guy's ass. That, that just says... I should have mentioned that last night to Larry Matisic when he was talking about the aura of a tough guy. In, in pro wrestling and how ridiculous this is right now with Jeff Jarrett. But the whole thing where Angle ran in and he signed the waiver and Jeff said you're a liar, you promised not to wrestle, and Kurt said that's right, but it's not a wrestling match, it's an exhibition. That did make sense. I thought this was all very well done. That so. did make sense. Thumbs up to this segment. I, I still don't know why Jeff wanted them to be exhibitions, but now that it was an exhibition, it makes sense that Kurt came back. Well, because they wanted to have that line. That's the entire That's reason. The same reason they have the cage match on Raw is because they could do the spot with Punk and exactly. Wade. Yeah, so, right. yeah, you, you have no. a, you have an idea, and then even if even if the the uh, the path to the idea is stupid, at least you will get to your idea at the step end. Step B is collect underwear. Step B blank. Step C profit. As a South Park joke, Ryan. Wasn't funny. Go on. Machine Guns wrestled AJ and Kazarian. They had about as good a match as he possibly could have in three minutes. Alex Shelley pinned AJ clean with the sliced bread. Uh, then the beer money came in and beat them up. Eric came out on the ramp, and he stared sternly, and then they showed a close-up of AJ Styles, and the announcers determined this meant Eric was pissed at AJ. He was pinned. He's sad at him being a failure. He was failing a lot. Uh, Pope was pissed that cameras were following him. He was said he was going to go to the ring and call out whoever had been filming him. AJ was in Eric's office. He was being chewed out by Bischoff and Flair. Bischoff and by the way, that meant that the Pope wanted someone to apologize, but he didn't know who. Yes. That's kind of funny. Well, he wanted yeah. Well, he wanted to find out who had done this, and he wanted that person to apologize. Yeah. If you came home and found out someone had uh, destroyed your computer, you would want to know who it was, and you wanted to apologize. So I'd, I'd like cut a promo in Fred Meyer? You might, actually. You sure. might. So, yes, yeah, so Eric was uh, mad at AJ. He said he was supposed to soften up the guns. It was a very simple job. AJ was trying to defend himself, saying they're the tag team champions. It's not that simple. Flair tried to play good cop. And he tried to tell AJ, we just want you to be the best you can be. You're the face of the company. And when he said that, Eric turned and looked at Flair over his shoulder. That was actually awesome. But, uh, yeah, that segment established nothing. This is fine. Yeah. Uh, Pope came out. He demanded to know who was filming him. Samoa Joe came out. Samoa Joe is now a stalker with a camera. <laughs> Samoa Joe is now a voyeur, yes. Yeah. Now, yeah has anyone had more stupid gimmicks in TNA <laughs> than, than Joe? He just keeps showing up. I know people are going to say, like, Eric Young. But I don't know. Seriously, Joe's like, you know, he's been kidnapped. Joe was kidnapped been, and came back with makeup on. and then A nation got of violence. Yes. He had a, a cock on his face. Remember he had a knife? A voyeur. He had a big knife he carried around with him. <laughs> he had a fucking shark dagger, you know. And all of this for a guy who's just an ass kicker who actually can't talk. Yeah. They you know? had this segment. I thought this was two, two men doing great delivery for a promo. Given a completely ludicrous premise. Oh no, I, I, uh, you know, it, it, it pro wrestling is supposed to be wacky, and this was as wacky as could be when Joe came out and was, you know, Pope is 
supposedly going to the animal shelter, and he's been going to the children's hospital and supposedly doing all this good. And Joe said that based on his, his voyeuristic footage, the when he was supposed to be helping strip clubs he was or children, he was actually in the strip club. And when he was supposed to be said in the nipple booth. The nipple booth. That's what he said. And when he was supposed to be sending money to shelters, the shelters claimed they got no money, and so therefore Pope must have been spending it on perhaps illicit substances. He almost flat out said drugs. And then he I think claimed he was also stealing dogs. I didn't quite get that one, but that's fine. And then Pope had an explanation for everything, such as when I was in the strip club, I was actually trying to talk these young college girls out of stripping for a buck. And I thought, okay, this is awesome. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, Pope told him to check himself before he wrecked himself. So we said, 2011, everybody. <laughs> that made it awesome, though. 2011. The biggest problem I had with it is that this all started, you know, the last pay-per-view, Pope was wrestling Abyss in a casket match. And now they have gone from that. Well, he's put in a box. He's put in a box, and this made him sleazy. Well, it made it's, him. It's just, it, it's all it being, it's being done too fast. But they're, the performance of these men I thought was great. Being done too fast, I didn't even think for one second about the storyline of the Pope recently. That, that's, that's, that's grounds for making yourself angry. <laughs> oh, I don't want that to happen. Dion was uh, doing a short little clip. He said, Bubba had talked him into, and this is a quote, a retirement angle. That's what he said. Retirement angle. Uh-huh. And then he had the balls to, uh, or the the, the, the temerity to sneak attack him and ambush him, so he accepted the parking lot challenge for later. Yeah. Madison and Sarita wrestled Mickey James and Velvet Sky. No, they wrestled Velvet Sky. Yeah, Mickey never tied to Nitchi. No, not a single time. Velvet Sky is a horrible pro wrestler, and she had a bad night. But she had great pants on. She looked great. That's true. So, yes, Velvet Sky wrestled the entire match badly. Let's talk about the highlight of this match. When Taz accidentally called, he meant to say Marilyn Monroe, and he said Marilyn Chambers, and the announcers lost it. <laughs> it was an impressive and amazing Freudian slip. Awesome. <laughs> they talked about that for a long time. The rest of this doesn't matter. And unlike when the announcers on SmackDown talked about Matt Stryker's cats, I was fine with them talking about Marilyn Chambers. It sure. Fits. I was fine with them talking about Matt Stryker's cats. <laughs> yes. So, anyway, uh, eventually Madison, uh, Mickey came in without a tag and ran wild for a bit, and then the ref threw her out. And while that was going on, Tara waylaid uh, Velvet with the elbow brace, and then she was pinned Somehow this is supposed to lead to Mickey versus Madison at the pay-per-view. We had Rob begging for a match with Jeff Hardy at Genesis, and Bischoff said he was going to give him a match tonight against another mystery man, and he wouldn't tell him who it was, and RVD was angry again because he's a scout. He's a scouter. We had Rob Terry against Doug Williams. The match went a minute, and then AJ ran in for the DQ, and I was ready to go, well, this is bullshit, but then I realized... It was Doug Williams and Rob Terry. Yeah. This was for the best. It was actually, when the announcers match at the beginning, the, the, the gimmick, obviously, that Eric uh, was talking about wanting them to have two matches, whereas, in fact, he wanted them to get destroyed. He said, Doug Williams, I have a challenge for you. I'll say. Going to wrestle Rob Terry. Indeed. That is quite the challenge. So we then had the, the parking lot brawl of Bubba Ray versus Devon. It was a bunch of shit talking as security kept them separated. And then Bubba hit a cheap shot and beat it up a little bit, and that was bad. I don't know what you're expecting, but it was underwhelming. What uh, was that beep again? That was me. The, your computer beeps when I scroll to the bottom of the page. So I hit the down arrow button and it beeps. I ordered a new power cord, by the way, so I'll have my computer back soon. The, uh, they told me at uh, uh, Best Buy and every other place I went for, for they would be 60 to $80. I found one on Amazon for 8 Hmm. So that made me happy. Uh, blah, blah, blah. We talked about uh, the parking lot brawl. Eric wanted uh, he wanted Jeff Jarrett to take out I Rob. I actually thought the parking lot brawl, by the way. I actually thought that whole thing was great. Because I thought for sure they were going to have him do a parking lot brawl. Well, this was better This was better than having them fight for a long time and then make you, by the end of it, it would have gone from a match you wanted to see to a match you wanted to avoid. Security broke it up. Bubba called him a, a lackey and a bitch and then cheap shotted him. And then they, they, uh, they kept him apart. This was this was the best thing they've done with these two guys in a long ass time. Actually, actually. first promo, yes. Yeah, yeah. it was on the go home show. You're actually right. You actually have a good point there. Yeah, I thought this was a great segment by the end. Uh, Bischoff told Jarrett he wanted him to take out Rob Van Dam tonight. Jarrett was upset because he was worried about facing Angle at pay per view, but 
Eric uh, promised it would be no DQ, and then Jarrett was fine. Uh, Lethal and Abyss, in a fine two-minute match. Lethal was actually doing a, a great job of a great job of being the scared small baby face. But when he when he had an advantage of the monster, he was desperate to follow up, and Abyss was taking a bunch of moves that wouldn't go down, and Jay finally hit a big top rope drop kick, and Abyss bumped it, everyone went crazy. Then Jay frantically made a cover, but Abyss kicked out, and then a uh, minute later, Abyss hit a black hole slam and had the pin. The match effectively ended there, but he picked Lethal up, because again, he's supposed to soften him up, so he took him to the corner to beat him up, and he was eventually DQ'd. This was stupid. I, I wouldn't have uh, minded so much if we hadn't had a fuck finish in the previous match. I mean, is it that hard to have one fuck finish in the early part of the first hour and then another fuck finish in an early part of, for example, the second hour as opposed to two in a row? So I thought this was stupid. They, they could have put the, I thought they made Lethal look like a complete idiot as usual. And it wasn't even like they beat him up two on one. Abyss killed him dead all by himself in a fair fight. Yeah. Yes. And we were supposed to care about this man. Why? Oh, no. And, yes, Kazarian came down, and he wanted to shake Lethal's hand. So Abyss picked up uh, Lethal's dead body and shook the hand for him. You know, sometimes people are like, you know, they'll say something like, well, Brian, you know, it's good booking because they, they uh, Kazarian came out and he, he, he humiliated Jay Lethal. And it's just like, it's not good booking unless when it's over, you care. And you can't tell me that anybody watched this segment and cared at all about Kazarian and Jay Lethal on Sunday. So if your booking results in nobody caring, then it doesn't matter if you did it what you consider to be right. It didn't work. So this sucked. Speaking of things that suck, we had this a... This was, by the way, when the show started falling off a cliff. <laughs> this is the exact moment the show fell off a cliff. Well, no, the two DQs in a row was when it fell off a cliff. I was okay all the way up to the Abyss Jay Lethal DQ. Then the show collapsed. That not well. This segment, this next segment was worse. We had a sit-down interview with Mike Tenay, Matt Morgan, Ken Anderson, and some ominous music. Mm -hmm. They were alone in the ring. There were no fans there. Anderson was crying a lot. Morgan Anderson again. It's like the biggest asshole. And again, I know that's the gimmick of him being an asshole. But it's possible to do an asshole gimmick where you're a likable guy. Stone Cold Steve Austin was a giant asshole. Sure. Everyone loved him. This guy is... This guy is whiny. An asshole who is completely unlikable. And yeah. he's supposed to be a babyface. Yeah. He was crying, and Morgan City was concerned about his family, and Anderson flipped out and said, we're not talking about my family. You know what I hated most about this? Besides the, the fact that Morgan was Morgan and Anderson was Anderson, and... Tanae Tanae Tanae. Tanae. <laughs> that's, a, that's a negative here. The the thing I hated about this was that it's all built around whether or not Anderson is making a mistake by wrestling this coming Sunday. And and they keep talking about how Anderson's like talking about how I've already taken two months off, I'm cleared, this and that. The problem is, in the last four weeks, he's wrestled twice. Yeah. When you can't remember your own fucking storylines and you take four straight days in a row, something's wrong. This How, story, if he, the fact that he's wrestled twice in the last four weeks makes his storyline make absolutely no sense. Correct. Why are we concerned about Mr. Anderson wrestling on Sunday? He wrestled two weeks ago and he wrestled, I can't remember the exact thing, but I actually went back and looked. He's wrestled twice in the last four weeks on television, and, and now we're supposed fine. to be concerned about him wrestling on Sunday. And in one of those matches, he was hit very hard in the head by Matt Morgan, and now he's fine. Yeah. So the the, the moment this went from horrible to hate-inducing, Mike Nate turned to Anderson and he said, you know, on all these, I've talked to thousands of wrestlers in this chair. You're the one guy I can't get a read on. And he said Anderson might be working him. Yeah. And Mike Tanay, and part of it is just he's Mike Tanay and this is how he talks, but everything he says sounds phony. It just does. And, and phony and unbelievable. So Morgan then, and we've talked about how stupid it is that he gave up his career. And I just like the idea that he, he thinks he could get a read on Juventud Guerrera. I think your nuts qualifies as a read. I guess. But, uh, he, uh... I get a read on Anderson. You're an asshole. You, you just suck at your job. Um, 
Morgan, you recall, quit his highly paid, guaranteed job for life position with uh, uh, Immortal to defend Anderson. Now they're having a match. At the end of this, he literally threatened to end Anderson's life. He said it's right cross in the hospital or carbon footprint and the graveyard. Yeah. What a dick. They're both supposed to be baby faces, everybody. Who could possibly want to see that match? That match is a horrifying thought, Ooh. actually. And Ooh. you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you, and this tells you something. I didn't even think about them actually having a match until right now. They're, they're going to wrestle. And I actually wrote down they are going to have a match for the number one contendership, and it didn't actually hit me until right now that that means they're going to wrestle each other. Yeah. Holy fuck. Wait, what do you. What a horrible build to a horrible match. I'm actually perversely excited to see that match, because that's going to be (laughs) god-awful. Maybe I'll be wrong, but I'll bet I won't be. That match is going to be horrible. Mr. Anderson and Matt Morgan. Yeah. In a one-on-one grappling battle, (laughs) given time. With with a feud where it's not clear who, if either of them, is the babyface. They're both babyfaces. I keep telling you that. That's impossible. (laughs) But it's true. Completely impossible. So the show was not yet over. We had the main event of Jeff Jarrett versus Rob Van Dam. It was no DQ, and thus all of Team Jarrett got involved. Rob beat them all up, and he was about to put Jarrett away when Jeff Hardy ran down and laid him out, and Jarrett covered him for the pin. That was the main event of the go-home show. Uh, they were beating up uh, Rob Moore when Matt Morgan came out to make the save for whatever reason. And by the way, this totally killed any interest in, in Jarrett versus Angle. Yeah. I mean, he just went out there and... He's not, killed, he's not a real MMA fighter, so he can't do anything. Yeah. So I guess the idea is that we're supposed to pay to theoretically see Kurt tap him out in one minute. And then if Kurt doesn't tap him out in one minute, what does that say about Kurt? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I You have a fine point here. don't know what's, what's happening. He's inferior to Matt Morgan. So, yes, uh, Morgan uh, laid him out, destroyed Jarrett, and then Anderson came down and... I'll be honest, I was not looking when this happened. He hit Morgan with a chair somehow. Yeah. He was trying to hit... Accidentally on purpose. Yeah, he was trying to hit one of the Team Jarrett guys or something. I don't care. And we were supposed to care, even though they both admitted that they don't care about each other. I don't. And, yes, it it ended with the... We have talked about this before, but the the buying point of the pay-per-view is not who will win. It's who will screw the other first. Mm -hmm. Who cares? I don't care. Again, I guess best, I wouldn't care about who would win anyway, but it's... This was the best impact and the best go-home show in months, but it, it did collapse in the last half hour, which is the worst last half hour of all month to collapse, but uh, that's what happened. What the hell can you do? To the back! How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Radio. We have Vinny here on the line. We're going to run down the TNA Genesis pay-per-view. The Matt Morgan-Mr. Anderson match, which I had predicted, if you listen to Wrestling Observer Live, looked horrible on paper was, in fact, pretty horrible on paper. And in the middle of it, this was looking like a solid thumbs-in-the-middle show. And by the end, a solid thumbs-up show, although not due to that match. It's actually due to the impromptu Jeff Hardy match at the end of the show with Mr. Anderson, where they decided with Jeff going to court on the 20th and perhaps being sentenced on drug charges, Probably a good idea to get the title off of him. And they did a hell of a job with it. I thought they did a a fantastic job. And overall, a thumbs-up show here for TNA Genesis. So, kicking off the new year in, I don't want to say style, but going into the new year, they've lost television in the U.K., presumably at some point it's going to come back, although there still has not been any announcement as to where the TV is going to air. They've lost pay-per-view in the U.K. You have to watch these shows now on TNA On Demand. The reaction show has been canceled. I mean, things are not looking great for TNA, but at least they had a good pay-per-view. They had a great show tonight, or a fine good show. And I guess we'll see where it goes at the tapings tomorrow. A good show with some great stuff. There was a guy that flew 5,000 miles for TNA. He alerted us via sign. And all I can say is, no matter how good the show is, I can't see it being worth flying 5,000 miles. That's over the ocean to see TNA. But that's just my opinion. Jay Lethal and Kazarian for the X title was the opener. I thought it was a three and a quarter star match. They had a, a, they had a hell of a match. It was a good opener, a yes. good battle. 
They uh, teased a ref bump, but didn't deliver early, but then ended up delivering at the end here in the opener. Not everything is perfect, everybody, but they did do a lot of cool things, and uh, Lethal fired up, went up top, Kazarian cut him off with an enzigiri, the Alberto Del Rio enzigiri. They teased his finisher a couple of times, then after Hebner got bumped, Kazarian crotched him on the ropes, hit the uh, pile driver for the pin, and won the championship, so that was one of the titles that Eric Bischoff, he promised to win all of the titles by the end of the night. And he ended up, as being a heel, uh, a liar at the end. Or at least wrong. <laughs> at least wrong. A couple of things. First of all, Frankie Kazarian is so much better as a heel than he ever was as a babyface. His comedy selling and bumps are fantastic. There's a point here where Lethal had a chop, and Kazarian sold it by first clutching his chest and dropping to his knees, and then in one motion from his knees, just rising back up to his feet. A couple of times he would take big moves and hop high into the air. Just great stuff. Um, I like this match as much as anything on the Dragon Gate pay-per-view we saw last week. All the high spots looked awesome. It, it, you take any highlight of this match, and it will hold up with any highlight from anything on that show. And more importantly, it wasn't all highlights. When Kazarian got the heat, he did not do 8 billion big moves. He would do. He did enough stuff that it was never boring, but he never tried to steal the show. Unlike, for example, AJ Styles, who does so much great stuff, people cheer him when he's a heel. Frankie just did moves. Uh, Lethal made his big comeback. There was also the other important part here is that there was uh, there was a lot of action here, but there was just as much theater. There was a point where Lethal, uh, Kazarian slapped Lethal across the face and then shouted angrily at him, and as Lethal, uh, as Kazarian standing there shouting. Lethal slowly raises his head, very pissed off, and then just chopped the piss out of him for several minutes. They went back and forth for a long time. There was a ref bump, although it really didn't lead to anything. So I, I guess it was just it's TNA having to do a ref bump. And uh, It didn't lead to anything? It led to the finish. Well, it, it did not lead to interference. It did not lead to a gimmick shot. The ref was bumped. Frank Kazarian shook the ropes, crossing Lethal. The ref turned around. Kazarian hit his finish and won. Uh, it was just the opener. They, you know, they did not do a billion near falls because it's the opener. You're not supposed to. Because Arian just did his finish and won. They didn't kick out of anything. Four star match. Flair and Bischoff were bitching at AJ backstage, and AJ claimed he had injured his knee. And I believe this is a a real injury. I think it's a hip flexor or something like that. But he is injured, and they took him off the show, and they replaced him in the match with Doug Williams with the Monster Abyss. Yes, we would, we would find that out later. A letdown! <laughs> this is a poor, poor decision. Uh, AJ, in this segment here, to uh, to explain that he was injured and could not wrestle, was in fact dressed to wrestle. Mm-hmm. I don't get it. And then he changed out of his clothes. He, he did change that later. Madison and Mickey for the women's title. A star in three-quarter. I... That's exactly what I did. I thought of rating it higher, but then I thought better. It was really long. It was not horrible or anything like that. It was not an average match. It was it was below average. It was not horrible. But it was better than most women's matches. Yeah. The, the, uh, the, the ending was... This was... A lot of stuff happened here. Mickey's running wild. She's about to hit the DDT when Tara's music plays. There's a big... Her music played. Yeah. She didn't just come out to interfere. Her music hit. Yeah. So Mickey let go of the DDT. There was all this hullabaloo outside. And then Madison made a big display of putting on a glove, shaking it to load whatever weapon is inside out to the front, and then playing possum. And I was actually, miraculously, TNA managed to capture all this. Usually when there's two things going on at once, we miss the important thing. The TNA director actually had a pretty good night tonight, as we'll discuss throughout the show, but... Then Mickey got back to the ring and picked her up, and apparently we will. And uh, Madison clobbered her and won. Um, the other detail here is that Mickey or Madison has new music. It sounds like somebody, uh, something, a drunk man singing a Cure song at a karaoke bar. That's not good. What uh, part of the uh, director's night was better? When he showed a close-up of Kurt Angle grabbing a blade, <laughs> or when he cut to a replay in the main event before they even given the championship to Mr. Anderson? Out of those two, probably the blade. <laughs> I was thinking more. There was a point here where Beer Money, in the next match, they hit their Beer Money suplex, you know, where they do a double suplex. Then one guy says beer, and the other guy says money. They've been doing this spot for years. And 
the director finally managed to capture it right, where he focused on one guy and he shouted beer, and then usually they would at that point cut to the crowd or the other restaurant on the apron or something. Instead, he simply panned over to the right, and there was the other guy going money. Hmm. That impressed me. That's better than they usually do. So after years of fuck-ups, he did it right one time, and that many had a great night. Yes. This is the best night ever. This, by the way, was the third singles match that Madison Rain has won in her entire TNA career. Yes. She's been the champion for how long now, everybody? I think twice, too. Christy interviewed Beer Money, Kaz, Flair, and Bischoff. Flair was Flair, and she was cackling. And he refused to say who RVD was going to be facing. But he did mention that Abyss was going to be taking on Williams. And I still don't understand the RVD thing. Why he needs to know so desperately who his opponent is. Number one, RVD himself debuted, I believe, as a mystery man. So shouldn't this be fair game that he has to face a mystery opponent? And second, if his music is about to hit, which happened later... Why is he begging to know right now who his opponent is? What is this one extra minute going to get for him? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I just like in this segment here where Kazarian opened it talking about his big win. He got a great heel promo about how awesome it was and how they're all going to be victorious. And he finishes, and Chrissy just says, that's awesome. Machine Guns and Beer Money for the tag titles. I gave it three and three-quarter stars. It was a uh, very good match. It was not the best match they've ever had. There was some great stuff at the end. It was a very traditional tag match through most of it. And finally, there was the beer in the face spot. Rude hit a spine buster on Saban, but Saban kicked out. And then they did a couple of other spots. And finally, uh, Saban accidentally booted his own partner. And then Rude rolled him up and grabbed the tights for the win and the titles. Not sure if this means at some point the guns are going to be breaking up. But that was certainly what I read into that there. What a goddamn horrible idea that is. Mm. But, uh, yeah, the match, I went three and a half. Again, it was good. It was missing something, but they, they, the, the guns got all kinds of shine at the beginning. They had stereo topes. You like the opener more than this match? Yes, I did. Mm. Yes, I did. And, uh, the, uh, like I said, this match was missing something. I don't, I don't, I couldn't put my finger on it, but there was something that it needed. Um, yeah, the, the We've talked about really everything. They teased the uh, machine guns breakup, which hopefully does not happen, because that does no one any favors. Maybe it was missing moves. No. No, I had moves. Devon did a promo backstage and talked about Bubba. He was going to kick his ass tonight. Very good promo. It was. So they had the match, and Devon... I enjoyed this match as like a an old-school professional wrestling battle and that you had a guy that everybody loved and a guy that everybody hated, and everything they did, for the most part, had a reason behind it. The one exception is, as they were brawling in the crowd a minute into the match, out of nowhere, Devon broke a glass bottle over Bubba's head, and then they just kept going. That is a finish in beer money matches. Here it was just a move. Are you certain it was not a plastic bottle? There was a plastic one, and then later there was a, a glass bottle. I did not see the glass one. Yeah, let's That's go back and check it out. So they got into the ring, they did a match, and I was really enjoying it. And then Devon made a comeback, and Bubba got a chain. The ref said, don't you use that. Devon cut him off, then he picked up the chain, started hitting Bubba. The ref DQ'd him. Shitty finish. The reason I really found this to be shitty is because at the beginning of the match, they brawled all over ringside. And the deal was, the ref hadn't rang the bell yet. So I was like, fine, this makes sense. So they brawl all over the place. They brawl, they brawl, they brawl, and they finally get into the ring. The referee rings the bell. Now the match has started. Rules need to be obeyed. So then they brawl into the crowd. Now, if they just brawled into the crowd and brawled all over the place and came back to the ring, there's a good chance that a, a substantial portion of the crowd, and largely the crowd that sends me hate mail, would forget that the ref should be counting them out. So, of course, what TNA did was they had to pan back and get a long shot of the referee on the corner pad begging them to please get back into the ring or else. So, once you've established that the ref doesn't give a shit what happens, then why does he fucking care about them using a chain later? So that was a good example of of the director being an idiot. You don't show the ref and remind people that he should be counting these guys out. They made this ref look like a fucking idiot throughout this match, and then after a chain shot, then all of a sudden he calls for a DQ. That was stupid. 
But anyway, the rest of the match I really enjoyed, and they set up a rematch, which of course they're going to do, and uh, it's going to be a long one at this rate. I did not hate the finish as much as you did. Uh, it, it, it did suck for a pay-per-view match, but as noted, this is the first match in a long series of matches, so they don't, should not have had a you know decisive winner here. But just have the referee not looking like he was for most of this match They're, and hit Devon with the chain and pin him. That that would have been better. I still wouldn't have had Devon pinned. If you could have just have just had why not? Because it's the first match. He got hit with the chain and he needs to go out for revenge. Yeah, that would work. But uh, it, it, I thought this was okay because Bubba introduced the chain because he's a dick, and then he. Uh, Devon procured it, and then he was just so angry and hated the man so much, he did, he was willing to get disqualified to beat him up more. That would have all been fine if yeah. it was important throughout the rest of the match to obey the rules. Yeah, you're and right. they made it clear that it wasn't. You can brawl in the fucking crowd as long as you want, and it doesn't matter. The ref is just going to go, will you guys please get back in the ring? Why didn't, when, when the chain was used, why didn't he just go, will you please stop using that chain, please? Actually, he did. <laughs> when, when, when Bubba was using it, I believe he actually said, hey. And that was the extent of it. So anyway, there's got to be consistency in this, otherwise it's stupid. Jeff did a uh, goofy MMA promo talking about how he'd never been taken off his feet, knocked down, or submitted. He had new rules for the exhibition. Three two-minute rounds, 30-second rest periods in between. Knockout, actually I think he just said submission or tap out. Grappling or submission only. No punching, no striking, no eye gouging. Yeah. He said he had the best cardio in wrestling history, better than Bob Backlund or Angelo Poffo. Mm -hmm. He promised... uh, Paraphrasing here, he promised to tire Kurt out in the first round, toy with him in the second, and then take him out in the third. This was a great heel promo. So, however, to to uh, recap, when this first started, he was messing around and didn't really know MMA. And then later, for a couple of weeks, he actually had, he was a shooter, and he was tapping people out legitimately. Then it went back to he didn't know what he was doing, because Red's uh, brother nearly beat him. And, by the way, who was never seen again after that show two weeks ago when he nearly beat Jeff Jarrett. And now he's just delusional. Yeah. That's all, right. that is all correct. If that's all acceptable, this, then fine. This promo, viewed in a vacuum by itself, was great. Doug Williams in Abyss. Fans weren't into this because they wanted AJ, and he didn't come out till the very end. And despite teasing that he was going to turn babyface, he ran out and ended up hitting Doug Williams with the TV title. And Abyss hit the black hole slam for the pin, won the title. They are now 2-0 and in terms of amassing titles. I gave it two stars. It was fine. It was not AJ Styles and Doug Williams, unfortunately. No. We, uh, what we had here was a clash of styles, because Abyss is a hardcore wrestler who is here doing a straight match. And uh, Doug Williams' strengths are, his, of course, his awesome wrestling, but he couldn't do that here because, A, Abyss is too big for most of it, and, B, he was working with uh, a, an injury. I don't know if it was real or not, but he had a hurt hand, so he couldn't grap- uh, grapple him at all. So he was stuck being a babyface in peril, and he doesn't have the charisma or screen presence to do that effectively. So it was not terrible. It was just not very good. And, uh, yeah, AJ Abyss grabbed, went for the, the uh, Janus, and that let AJ come in and interfere, and Abyss won, so there you go. I didn't like how they kept talking about how uh, Doug kept trying and failing to hit the Chaos Theory suplex. Yes. And they never did. Well, he, he never did, and, a, and also they attributed it to the wrist injury, which would not help, but he's also, you know, 90 pounds bigger. I just like how they, they kept talking about how Generico had never hit Steen with the top row brain buster, and then, of course, in the end, he did. Well, I'm TNA. This is not going to happen here. Hey, this guy just can't do it, and he never will. Correct. Why even bring it up is my question. They never bring up John Cena being unable to, to do the FU on somebody unless he's actually going to do it at the end. And eventually he does, yes. RVD backstage, demanding to know who his opponent was in the next match. And, uh, of course, Bischoff goes, you want Hardy? You got Hardy in the ring. And then RVD's music hits, so he got one minute of, of warning I don't know, again, how that helped him prepare for this battle. But he went out there, and it was, of course, Matt Hardy, who, uh, <laughs> I, I say solid thumbs-up show, but there's a, there was a lot of stuff on this show. That <laughs> it, was, was, it was still a TNA show. Matt Hardy, listen, personally, I would not have signed Matt Hardy to TNA. There's questionable issues about him 
from watching a lot of his videos on YouTube. He has done himself no favors. Now, that said, if if I were uh, the booker and my boss said he's hired, so book, well, he'd be a baby face because people seem to like him a lot. On TNA, no. TNA, he debuts as a heel. Furthermore, he debuts as a heel. I'm sorry, yeah, heel against uh, RVD, a babyface, and they proceed to have a match where I don't even know who was supposed to be the babyface and who was supposed to be the heel. Everybody chanted for Matt Hardy, and you, you need to, you're understanding that the fans chanted Hardy as loudly and passionately as they could muster. Yeah. They were so happy to see him there. Then he offered his hand to Rob Van Dam in a gesture of sportsmanship, and Rob turned him down. Yeah. So they did a bunch of stuff. The crowd was, first there was dueling chants of RVD and Let's Go Hardy, and then eventually the crowd settled down and decided to cheer for neither man. Well, it was, that's because, first off, they couldn't decide who they wanted to be the fucking baby face. Like, I, 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 I presume that they want Matt to be cheered, but he was supposed to be the heel in this match because Bischoff sent him out as a setup guy. For for Jeff Hardy later, if RVD happened to beat him, regardless, Matt goes out there and he works as the babyface in peril, and I guess people are supposed to be cheering him, but they're also supposed to be booing him, and then he gets some heat, and it's just like the psychology of this match was so fucking goofy that nobody knew what they were supposed to do as a fan, so they just started cheering for Matt here and there, and RVD here and there, and they weren't in any of the comebacks or anything like that. They, uh, the announcers claimed that Matt Hardy was now trending on Twitter. That was a lie. <laughs> Although Jar Jar Binks was uh, trending on Twitter. I no, don't know that why. Been a debut. I don't know why. But they had the match, and uh, Five Star Frog Splash, and then the ref stopped the count. And Matt did not grab the ropes, but his hand was under the ropes. The fans had no idea what was going on. They were all pissed off. And then Matt hit the twist of fate. And even though RVD's foot was under the ropes, uh, Rep. Jackson James counted the pin. So at least they're continuing the storyline that this guy is actually Bischoff's son and he's going to be a heel ref. And they're going slow. But at least this played into that storyline. And the rest of the match, I gave it a star, probably generous. This, I went, this pretty much blew. I went three-quarter star. It certainly sucked. It was very long. It was boring. It was uneventful. There was a point here where Taz started talking about how uh, Matt was the mystery opponent, what an advantage that was, and he mentioned that he himself was once a mystery opponent against Kurt Angle, and it led him to a win. All I can think was, that debut was so much better than this one. It's been a decade now, and I still remember that match. So, yes, uh, they did the finish there. Uh, I... Rob was never defeated, so I guess this makes Matt Hardy the linear TNA champion, if anyone on earth could possibly care about that. No one does. And the, the last note here, the, uh, a thumbs up for the director again, because when Rob hit his frog splash, they cut to a camera like in the back of the impact zone that showed the, the ring and all the fans, and you can see just how goddamn high Rob Van Dam gets on that. Hangle did a promo talking about how if Jarrett wanted to know what kind of shape he was in, he could ask his wife, and said he was going to kick Jarrett's ass tonight, and then howled with laughter. This is great. It was quite great. So Jarrett came out with Gunner Murphy and the rest of Team Jarrett, and Angle told them that if they even stepped foot into the ring, he swore to God he would break their necks. Rules, of course, three three-minute rounds. Two-minute rounds, I'm sorry. So the first round was nothing. Angle laid down and told him to grab a hold. Jarrett refused. Angle went for a takedown. Jarrett got the ropes. They can't even do fake MMA because when Jarrett grabbed the ropes, the ref was telling Angle to break. Should be telling Jeff to break. You can't grab the fucking ropes. So Angle got a takedown and put on a choke as the round ended. So the second round came out, and Angle put him in a bunch of holds over and over. And you get a different hold every time, and then release it, and then hold up uh, however many fingers it was. So the first choke, he held up one. The next was a Kimura, he held up two. And then he got a side choke and held up three. So finally, in the third round, Gunner and Murphy had put something on Jarrett's forearm. He rubbed it into Kurt's eyes. Kurt was blind, and then instead of winning, Jarrett started punching him for the disqualification because there are no punches in this MMA match. Yeah. So so does that mean Kurt won $100,000? I don't know. Would well, it have been that hard to just, and you, you had a two-minute round? Of course it would be that hard. You couldn't Vince. have Jarrett blind him, and then Kurt survives the two minutes, and then Jeff starts punching him? Of course not. 
Vince, seriously. Perhaps I'm too dumb. Stop thinking so much. So they had the uh, close-up of the blade here, as noted, mm-hmm. and uh, Jared beat him up. And i got to admit, this got a hell of a lot of heat, so more power to him. It, yeah, it was, it was more an angle than a match, but I really enjoyed it for what it was. And the other best part was, actually beforehand, Kurt came out, he explained to Team Jarrett, who he called Sons of Bitches, if any of you interfere, I will break your neck. He didn't interfere. Of course not. Because he's scary. And right right before the match, they cut to Kurt, and he had a look on his face that I don't know how to describe. I, I would say kid on Christmas, because he was that eager and excited, except he was also completely, perfectly calm and in control. He was just a man who had who knew that the next six minutes was going to be the best of his life, and was looking forward to it. So then finally, uh, they announced that on Impact, Jared is going to retire undefeated from MMA. Going to be a retirement party, and all three of us are going to be there. Angle, Jared, and someone else we would not mention, who presumably was Karen. There you go. Need some water there? No. Yeah. Uh, they did a. Uh, what do we have next? Morgan and Anderson. Event. Yeah, this this uh, got a star and a half. And that's being generous. They had a match. It was not horrendous. I expected much much worse, but it really was not very good. Uh, Morgan is a big guy. Anderson is not that great a worker. They did all of their normal stuff. And uh, finally, they did some spots at the end. And a couple of notes on this match. First off, as I've said a million times, Matt Morgan was so concerned about Mr. Anderson competing with a head injury that, in his words, he quit fortune and threw away a guaranteed paycheck for the rest of his life. That's what he said. That is what Matt Morgan said. So... From there, the first thing he does in this match is he goes to work on Mr. Anderson's head. Yes, he targeted the head. He didn't go after his arm, his leg, his back. No. This guy that he was so concerned about, because Mr. Anderson had been a dick for two weeks to him, he decided, I'm going to attack your head, your concussed head. I'm going to ruin your life. I'm going to kill you, basically. So then he works over his head for a while, and... Of course, then they switch around again, so now Morgan is the baby face in peril. Again, psychology was all fucked up. Nobody knew what to cheer for, although more people did like Anderson than Morgan. So, finally, they, they did a uh, couple of spots, a couple of times, actually. And the finish, I swear to God, I swear to God this is the finish. And keep in mind when you hear this that Mr. Anderson, the gimmick was he had a serious head injury. The finish was they Bonked heads, and then the guy with the head injury small packaged the other guy for the pin. Right. Think I'm making that up. <laughs> I couldn't. <laughs> Somebody came up with that for a finish, and then they did. So, yeah, then Bischoff came out and said that he was there to tell Anderson how impressed he was with him tonight. said as the number one contender, he was gonna, not going to jack him around or make him wait. He was going to give him his world championship match right now. So we got Jeff Hardy and Mr. Anderson. This was not the best match on the show, but this was the best thing on the show. They had a match. Jared came, or Jeff came out. He was smoking. He was in street clothes. By that, I mean he was wearing a tie. They were trying to suggest he was completely unconcerned facing a concussed man. And Jared, uh, Jeff went right to work on him, hit the twist of fate. Morgan kicked out. And uh, it became a match. There was a line in here where Tanae said, Jeff wasn't even breaking a sweat, to which Taz replied, He's sweating, but not because of Anderson. What the hell was that supposed to mean? I can think of a lot of things. <laughs> well, that was some perhaps right he was there. referring to the hot television lights. Perhaps he was. So they kicked out of everybody's finisher a million times. We had Mick Foley running down when uh, somebody tried to use a chair. And uh, there was a, uh, what do we have? Uh, Bischoff got in the ring with the chair and... Anderson gave him the mic check, and then Jeff came in and was going to try and hit another twist of fate, but Anderson turned that into the mic check for the pin. Place went ape shit, and uh, again, not the best match, but as a as a spectacle on this show, this was awesome. It was more an angle than anything else, but they had a match in the midst of the angle. I don't know how long it was, maybe six, seven minutes, but uh, I thought this whole thing was extremely well done, and uh, the people loved Anderson. It was a uh, great finish. It was a great addition to the show after the shitty scheduled main event. And uh, overall, when the show was over, because of this, I left thinking, that was a good show. Indeed. That's what you're supposed to do on your pay-per-views. And it's 
comical because in the middle of the Morgan Anderson match, the the first two thirds of that match were very very bad, bordering with the RVD Hardy match for the worst match on the show. And I'm sitting there, I'm looking back over my notes and thinking, you know, if you had this exact same show and just put the matches in the reverse order, it would be pretty good. Because it would have ended with an awesome Lethal Kazarian match instead of ending with this lame Morgan Anderson match. And to be fair, that match, the last two or three minutes, did pick up significantly. The crowd got much more into it, and they were cheering for Anderson by the end, so it was not a terrible match. It was a terrible main event. And then they did the whole thing with Jeff, and here is an instance where TNA, a lot of times, as we will often talk about, We'll have 8,000 things going on in a match, and it gets annoying. Here was an instant where it all worked for a couple of reasons. First of all, they did not rush through it. They had Jeff come out, and Anderson kicked out of a couple of twist of fates, and Hardy was concerned, and then Anderson got a uh, almost a fluke leverage move to pull him to the floor, and then while the rest back was turned, Morgan, who was actually asking whatever happened to him, he pops up and he lays Hardy out with a discus lariat. So now they're virtually on even ground. So the match continues. They brawl more. A few minutes go by, Jeff grabs a chair, that brings Foley out, he pulls the chair away, they yell at each other, Flair comes out, and as he and Foley are bickering, there was a point where I was certain the match would continue and we would see just Flair and Foley yelling at each other, but no, they cut back to the ring where the match was going on, he continued, they did some more wrestling, Jeff hit the uh, swanton, but Anderson kicked out again, now Jeff was desperate in dire straits, he began to call for Matt, Matt Hardy came down to save his brother, but RVD still pissed off about losing earlier, came down to, to brawl with Matt, and they brawled to the back, and I'm not terribly excited to see that match again, but at least it made sense here. And then finally, there's Bischoff, desperately trying to save his man to, pervert, to preserve the victory he thought was so safely in hand, and he gets laid out and made to look like a fool, and then Anderson lays out Hardy and wins. So by the end here, you have Anderson that actually looked like the dude. He was the man by the end of all this. Uh, Matt Morgan had somewhat redeemed himself for trying to take out the guy's head because he helped him win. Fleur and Foley still hate each other, and RVD still hates the Hardys. Everything here was a win. Yes, a, a gigantic success, almost an amazing success, and uh, probably the best thing that they have done in almost oh, a year a now. a long-ass time. Yeah, as far almost as a it, year. Yeah, and it, it, all, it all felt important. It, all felt, it was all fun to see. It was all memorable. Just a, a giant win. The only thing, Anderson afterwards was celebrating with that stupid Jeff Hardy belt. And on Thursday, he needs to find a, like a giant axe. And just destroy the thing. Well, he'll just beat up Eric Young and take the other belt back. <laughs> Maybe he can just do that. I'd be fine with that. So then, as he's celebrating, the, the his music playing, fans are cheering. Tanae, Mike Tanae then says the following. 2011 may be the year of the asshole. That's how they went off the and air. fade to black. Yeah. <laughs> and scene. There's a joke to be made there, but I'm not going to make it. To the back! I know that people are going to be outraged to hear this, but... Don't look at me. It's not our fault. This is not my fault. But we came in to watch Impact, and the DVR box said REC, which is record, and it claimed it was recording, but in fact, it was not recording. No. And so we watched the last half hour of the show, which, fear not, was horrible. So we'll talk about we that. We need to be able to about this for an hour. Holy Christ, that main event was horrible. I would like to think that, once again, your Kiowa box simply rejected impact. Now, all i got to say is that people always try to start the website wars and that sort of thing. Not my thing. I don't really care one way or the other. But I, I was told that perhaps accusations were made about you and I and Dragon Gate USA... I don't even know what they were. I didn't even listen. I suspect that people blew the whole thing way out of proportion. And quite frankly, I don't really care. But I will start my own website war right here by saying, Wait, Keller gave that main event two and a half stars? I will double check this. That was the worst fucking match I've seen in months. It was god damned awful. I think you put it best. That may have been the worst match of nearly every man oh, in the ring's oh, career. All four men's career, yes. And I can't say that because I'm sure Rob Van Dam has had some horrible matches, and I'm sure that, that God forbid, Mr. Anderson has had a career of terrible matches. But sweet Jesus, this match was bad. It was all four men involved. It was Anderson, Mr. Anderson and Rob Van Dam against Matt and Jeff Hardy. All four of them looked as either just dirt worst. Like, it's not like there was one guy having a bad performance, or even three guys having a bad performance and one guy who looked okay. All four men looked just miserable. I don't even know what this match was supposed to be. We're going to start with this match before we even get Granny here on the line. I can't get over how horrible this match was. 
This match, first off, Matt Hardy, what happened? I mean, that's a rhetorical question. But if he goes on Twitter tomorrow and tries to tell me that I don't know anything about wrestling because I thought this match was horrible, then I got words for him. Two words. Fuck you. I didn't say the two words. You can all decide what those two words might be. But I just got two words for the guy. That match was horrible. This was a goddamn awful match. He looked awful. Match. Yes. He actually made Jeff Hardy look like the level-headed one in the family. The I, I didn't even understand like what the match was supposed to be. Like I was I was seriously trying to figure out who are the baby faces and heels because I'm pretty sure that the Hardys are supposed to be heels, but I'm not entirely sure because Matt's doing an awful lot of selling here in the corner. I don't know what's going on in this match and. Everything looked bad. People were out of position. There was running into folks. There were terrible bumps to the outside. It was just horrendous. The, the absolute zenith of the match was Matt had the heat on Rob Van Dam. And we discussed this when he Matt debuted in the pay-per-view. He's fat now. But just say it. He is just fat now. So I thought he looked thicker at the pay-per-view, but upon watching Impact, he is just fat. Sloppy fat. He may be thicker, but he's fat. Yeah. So he went to the top rope for a moonsault. And all I could think was, Brian, you've known me for a long time. You know I'm a very slow man. If I was down in the ring and Matt Hardy went to the top rope for a moonsault, I would break the sound barrier and get out of the way. So he went for a moonsault. He missed, of course, because Rob Van Dam is not that stupid. Then Rob tried a moonsault. I believe Jeff was supposed to pull Matt out of the way. But either he, either he forgot or Matt is just too fat to move. <laughs> but uh, I know, because Jeff was was trying, but, okay. but Matt was immobile. So, so I don't Matt, know if, if Matt did not assist his, his brother. His coefficient of friction was too high. <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 Im, Im, he embedded himself into the canvas when he landed. Regardless, he was still there, and Rob had to, in midair, try to sort of miss him. Then, then it right on his face. Right on his face. Then Jeff managed to pull Rob outside, or excuse me, pull Matt outside. Then Jeff and Matt had a huddle and just stood there. Mm -hmm. And then Rob Van Dam, who, you know, he's not the most, uh, what's the word? He's not the excellence of execution, but he's a pretty goddamn great athlete. He did the ugliest, sloppiest, most out-of-control dive onto the two of them that I could fathom. Yeah. And here's where I thought to myself, you know, at, at that moment I thought to myself, Mr. Anderson may be the best guy in this match. So they go to commercial, they come back from commercial, and... You were wrong. Yes. One of the, I believe Matt went for a uh, near fall. He, he hit uh, the, he had a move on uh, Rob and went for a pinfall. And Anderson came in to break, break the pin and tripped on the ropes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no one could do anything here. Then, and this... Th th listen closely to what I say and think carefully about what it means. Matt attempted to hit Rob Van Dam with a side effect, and the move was edited. Yes. Think of all the shit we have seen week in and week out on this television show. <laughs> and this is the what they decided needed to be fixed. Five years. This was so bad, not even Impact, not even TNA, could dare to put it on television. Yeah. Holy ass. This is a terrible match. This was everything that is wrong with pro wrestling today. Anderson still has a smidgen of of caring within his soul because he's the champion, I think. RVD has given up. <laughs> Jeff Hardy has given up. Jeff Hardy gives up every time he comes to TNA. You watch Jeff Hardy in TNA, and then he goes to WWE, and he's awesome. Then he goes back to TNA, and, he, and he he's sucks again. an indie guy. And Matt was just the worst I've ever seen. Like, I've never seen Matt Hardy look worse than this. And if he comes on here again and tries to claim that this was a good match and that he looked good, he needs to go back and watch some tapes. I just don't get it. Like, how can you not take some pride in yourself? Like, I wrestled in Tulalip. I wrestled in Tulalip Championship Wrestling, which had no TV, and 100 folks showed up. And granted, I, I put the matches on YouTube, but still, the point is, I didn't even film those matches that end up on YouTube half the time. In fact, if I recall correctly, I filmed about uh, three of my matches before I gave up. They, they were all filmed by others and put on YouTube. And I had, I took pride in my appearance. I, I took pride. I went to the gym. I worked out. I did cardio. I did circuit training. I tried to be in shape in that fucking ring. And here's Matt on live television 
in 2011, well, not live television, but national, national television on Spike TV, and there were spots in this match where he was glacially slow, and his gut gets bigger every time I see him. I sort of understand why people just can't get it together. I don't know. I was very, very saddened watching this match. I mean, I was really, this was like when you see that Legends Battle Royal, and you realize that everybody is old, and then, you know, you think back to their, their heyday and their prime, and you get really sad. That's how I felt watching this match. It just felt really sad. And it's not like Matt's 50. It's not like Jeff's 50. You know, all these guys. All I got to do is think, you know, the show sucks. It's a horrible show. The, the booking is hideous. But by God, I'm going to be the best I can here. I'm going to lose some weight. I'm going to get in shape. And I'm going to fucking try. I'm going to try and set an example right here. That's what I'd be thinking. But I don't know. I guess that's just that's, me. That's why you're in that chair. Find a find a match of mine on YouTube where I'm even in, in close to the shape of Matt Hardy. The match doesn't exist. You'll find one clip of me yelling at Jack Evans and telling him not to kill himself. And you know what? When I saw that clip, I went, Christ, you're fat, you fat ass. No. And I went on a diet and I lost all the weight. We have talked about this before. There was a point where you were bulking up and you overshot your target. Yeah. And you were still working. You know what you did? You put a shirt on. <laughs> That's true. It's not hard. Yeah. It's not hard. I, I put a singlet on, and I, I pulled it all the way up, and I, I covered my gut. And then I got to work losing the weight, which I then did. Yeah. It's just, there was a point here. Anderson, uh... You know, it's supposed to be the wrestlers that are yelling at the dirt sheet writers about how you don't know what you're doing. I'm here yelling at Matt Hardy to get your fucking ass in shape. I got in shape. I'm sitting here buying a computer or yelling into a microphone. You know what? I got in great shape, and you'll never find a video of me on YouTube wrestling where I'm in the shape you're in right now, Matt. So get your ass in the gym and straighten up, young fella. Yeah. That's my speech there, for today. There's, there's more about how awful this match was. Anderson eventually got a hot tag. You know how usually the, you get the hot tag and you hit, like, a series of big moves and lead up to your finisher? Anderson tagged in and hit, like, a clothesline and a mic check. Yeah. Boom. So the uh, there was some silliness of the ref bump. He might check the other Hardy. So now both Hardys are down. And the ref's out of the ring. So <laughs> Jeff was laying on, he's selling, he's laying on the on his back under the ropes. And Anderson and Matt are in the middle of the ring. And Rob takes it upon himself to basically do a giant big splash to dive over onto Jeff and punch him some more. Fear money came in and interfered. The Hardys eventually won. Just shit. The Taz was talking about first. Oh, I didn't mention this. They pointed out it was the Hardy's first match as a team in three years, mm -hmm. and the we see this all every time. Put it on TV for free with no build. Of course, of course. So the baby faces, I think, come out first. Already and Anderson came out first. And then the Hardys were introduced. <laughs> I don't know if this is a new video or if I just never noticed it in Jeff's video. But as, they, as they're coming down, you can see the video playing on the big screen behind them. And you see a computer link that says, add as friend. And you see this hand uh, glide over the screen to click it. And then a giant red stamp goes, denied! <laughs> the only positive about this entire segment. So, the Hardys, the fucking Hardy boys, are together again. They come out on stage together as a pair for the first time in years. And then Anderson goes to attack them, and uh, they started brawling, and there was no heat for this. Mm -mm. I don't know hard to believe. But yes, they managed to kill the heat for the Hardy Boys. So then Taz starts talking, and uh, you can't just say, you know, you can't just say Matt and Jeff were a great tag team in pro wrestling for the past decade. No, Taz has to start talking in detail about what happened in that other company. You know, the major leagues. Yeah. Talking about Matt being punished when Jeff came to TNA and then Jeff went back and now they're both here and <sighs> sucks. It just sucks. I just want to say one more thing. I know that I yelled a lot and there was a lot of vitriol in what I said, but deep down I'm just trying to be friendly here. Just trying to be a friend of Matt. In what way? He's too heavy. He's not very healthy. Yeah, he's that just, way. Are you concerned he will die? No, I'm not concerned. I'm not, I'm not on this death watch bullshit or anything like that. I'm just saying that 
for for the he would feel better if he dropped a few pounds. He'd feel better. He'd work better. He'd look better. He'd have a chance maybe of of someday going back to WWE and making money again. He wouldn't be stuck in this promotion, booking him into oblivion. I mean, it's not like there ain't hope for Matt. I mean, I realize he wasn't happy with where he was in WWE, but he wasn't in a terrible spot. He was beloved by the fans. They all knew him. He had a bunch of, of wacky, weird followers on Facebook and Twitter, I'm sure. And he was somewhere in the wrestling business. And he's now in the ninth circle of hell. And it's time to start clawing his way out of that. Just trying to motivate the man. Because obviously all other forms of motivation don't work, so now he just needs to be yelled at. I know it's going to make no difference. The only other, th- other thing at I want to mention. At least I can say that I tried. The only other thing I want to mention of what we saw on Impact. Right before this, there was a segment with Immortal was in their locker room. It's a room about, looks to be about eight feet wide and ten feet long. There's 47 men walking around in there. And the Hardys were getting ready for this here tag match, and Eric Bishop was talking about it. And Rick Flair got excited, and he clapped his hands and said, and this is a quote, Hardy is looking as only they can look. Well, true. It is true. True. To the back! All right, Impact. Um, there's some good wrestling on the show. The angles were... Uh, this was like this was like a... This was like the argument for getting someone with a clue in creative, but not necessarily getting rid of Vince Russo. I even mentioned this in the newsletter this week. I don't even care if the guy is still with the company. In the role of somebody that comes up with ideas that somebody with a clue makes good. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Yes. He comes up with all these great ideas, but then has no fucking idea what to do with them, and so they all crash and burn. That's like the story of this show. Like a lot of uh, ideas on this show, there's like, all right, that's a great idea. Good start here. And then by the end of the show, fucked up beyond belief. And the Kurt Angle thing is one of them. It starts out with Kurt coming down to the ring. He's in an unhappy mood as usual. Of course, for those of you that have forgotten, he's fired. He's not employed with his company, but he's still coming out with his music. All right? Well, they, they showed that. He stopped by the production desk and basically threatened under penalty of violence to play his song. Hmm. So they did, because they were scared of him. All right, well, let's keep that in mind there as we move on. All right. So he comes out with his music, does this big promo, and uh, talked about how much of a whore his wife was, he says. Then he brought her to the company, glowing recommendation. She ended up an asset both inside and outside the ring. Says every time he turned around, she was hanging out with Jeff Jarrett. Said the whole thing was bad enough without Jarrett making it personal. And he said if he was guilty of anything, it was the fact that he didn't spend enough time with his family. And he was weeping at this point. He was weeping and talking about being a great husband and an incredible father. He wasn't a bad father, he said. He just wanted his family to have it all. He was at least half wrong. So anyway, he told Karen they could do this the easy way or the hard way. I guess presumably they're going to have a shoot. And he said that they could basically be friends and put this all behind them and move on with their lives. Or he could air all of their dirty laundry that he could dig up. So Jared's music hit. Out came a bunch of geeks. He beat their asses. And then Jared came out. Actually, Jared's music hit. Jared didn't come out. Jared's music hit, and out came Hogan and Flair. I'm sorry, Bischoff and Flair. My God, my nose. Do you want to start over? No. But anyway, Flair's howling like a madman, and the cops are there, and they come out, and they arrest Kurt Angle. That's the key to this whole thing. Forget all the fuck-ups I did. The key to this is Kurt Angle came out. He cut a promo. Uh, Jeff Jarrett, uh, his wife was there. And anyway, the cops came out and arrested Angle. That's the key. The cops Hmm. arrested Kurt Angle. We got all that? At the, the, the end of the segment, Did Kurt I miss anything Angle about cops arresting Kurt Angle? had been arrested by the police and led out of the building. The police arrested Kurt Angle and took him out of the building. That's the key to this segment. We all got that? Right. All right. So then the announcers say, uh, oh, Jeff and Karen are about to arrive. They go to commercial and come back, and sure as shit, they arrived. Then they cut away. We've got a match. Sarita, Velvet, Mickey, and Madison. I expected much worse. As long as Velvet Sky was not involved, this is perfectly fine. Actually, she did some lucha with Sarita and was perfectly fine. Could have been she, a lot worse. There was the one point where she tried to do the... Uh, the wheelbarrow? The wheelbarrow into an arm drag. I thought that looked all right. It didn't look terrible, but it's supposed to, you know, you, you're in the wheelbarrow and you turn into an arm drag and you kind of land on your hip and roll with it. She landed on her ass with a giant thud. Yeah. It looked like she had taken a move. So then they finish. Of course, I'm sitting here thinking, this match is all right. And then they do the finish. 
Nikki goes up top, and Tara comes out and clonks her with a, her elbow brace, knocking her out. She's unconscious in the ring. Of course, it's TNA. This does not lead to the finish. No. Nikki is in there dead, and Madison starts loading up her loaded glove. Because you see, in the same match, we have to have a loaded elbow brace and a loaded glove. Yes. So she loads it up, and she loads it up, and she loads it up. And I'm thinking, why don't you just cover Mickey? She's fucking unconscious. So she loads it up and loads it up and loads it up, and Mickey finally starts to get to her feet. So then Madison takes a big swing and misses. I believe she hit velvet. And then Mickey rolled her up for the pin. Yes, the the key to this is that... uh the key to this is, why did they bother knocking Mickey out in the first place? Well, that's one of the keys. The other key is that, as Madison's loading the glove, the other girls are all fighting to get to their feet, and their heads are all in a row. And I was hoping they were going to do the, the desk toy spot where she hit Mickey, and the force travel through Mickey's head, through Velvet's, and into Sarita's. But instead, no, two of the women just dodged. And then the end, Sarita said something dumb that, that uh, Mickey was thinking? No, she just got, got hit. <laughs> she sold it. I see. Anyway. My joke was better. All right. Well, either way, uh, two women dodged. The third got hit. I think it was Sarita. And then, yes, Mickey rolled up Madison and pinned her. But, and, and by the way, even the pin, uh, Mickey did a roll up, and like the ref counted two and then paused, like he thought she would kick out, and then counted a delayed three. It looked bad. So They fucked it up. They fucked it up. That's the key up. to this, this yeah. match and the show. We had a mystery Asian fellow filming backstage. They showed this for about three seconds, cut away, never seen again. Yeah. There was a there was a fun segment with uh, beer money doing a backstage promo that involved James Storm doing eight ounce curls with beer bottles you see, mm-hmm. and then he assured Rude that he could drink beer and have fun, but he would be serious in the ring. So then we got fuck up part two. Now, if you recall the beginning of the show, Kurt, Ang- Kurt Angle came out and the in the the, the authorities apprehended. And incarcerated him, Which, supposedly. by the way, was not that long ago. No, it was ten minutes earlier. Yeah. The cops came and they kicked Kurt Angle out of the building. Now, they could have done part two of the angle next week, you know? Try and build this up for a while. Try and pop a buy rate for once in their lives. Of course not. Ten minutes after he's kicked out of the fucking building by the police, by the popos, he returns. He's just walking around backstage. He's back in the building, just Walking around. You see, he came back. I can't even believe I wrote those words in this issue. He came back. He eluded the law like Kaiser Soze and returned to the building. So Flair came out with Rob Terry, and they cut a promo on Matt Morgan, at which point I thought, you've got to be kidding me. Yes. You're not really doing this feud. It's impossible. So, in fact, they are doing the feud, and they proceeded to do it immediately. So, out comes Matt Morgan... And he leaps in the air, does a high kick, and pins Rob Terry in about three seconds. Yep. Perfect. Nothing. That part is fine. Nothing could have been done better. I have no complaints with that part. That saved us from months of horrendous television. So, he does that, and then Flair gets mad. Flair is outside the ring. He takes off his jacket. Matt Morgan is outside the ring. Flair walks up to Matt Morgan and gives him a chop. Nothing. He gives him another chop. Nothing. He punches him in the face. Nothing. He punches him in the face again. Nothing. At which point Ric Flair goes, ah! And he turns and leaps into the ring. <laughs> this, this is the key. <laughs> Matt Morgan goes after him. Flair proceeds to try his chops again to no avail. He tries his punches again to no avail. He decides to hit the ropes and throw another chop, but fucking Rob Terry is right there in the middle of the ring. So Flair... Leaps over him like a drop down, hits the ropes, leaps over him again, throws a chop to no avail. So, of course, at this point, Matt Morgan runs wild, but I don't even know what happened because I was dying watching Ric Flair. Rick Flair the was best the man of all time. The part outside, when <laughs> we have seen Ric Flair do this exact same spot 47,000 times where he is facing a large man, he hits him with a dozen blows, none of them work, and then he panics. But usually he will drop to his knees and hold up his hands and scream. Uh, he may just shake his head back and forth and arch his back. This time, Ric Flair turned his back to Matt Morgan and attempted to run for cover. No, but this is the best part. This is why I love professional wrestling. He didn't run up the ramp to the backstage area and perhaps out the building. No, his 
idea was, I'm going to get away by getting in the ring. Yes. Where, of course, he was trapped. Once he got because, he was you trapped. know, there's ropes there. Yes. No way to escape. Yep. So then he had to attempt to do another another attack inside the ring. I guess because he's Ric Flair and all of his success came inside the ring. But uh, he failed. So... It was glorious. It was glorious, and then, of course, they fucked it up. So, yeah, uh, what happened was, by the end of this side, by the way, I really, really bad actually wanted to see a Matt Morgan versus Ric Flair match. But we will get it. So Abyss came down. Uh, Abyss and uh, Abyss beat up Morgan for a while. Then Abyss and Rob Terry beat up Morgan for a while. Then Morgan cut them off and made his own comeback, and Flair ran away again. Then Morgan got cut off again, and it was three-on-one for a while. It's one of those bits where... Why do they do that? Three segments. Why doesn't Matt Morgan just win? He beats up Ric Flair, and then two heels come and beat him up. I don't know. It Why is... does this have to be so difficult? It's one of those bits where they do three segments that should be on three different shows all at once. So, yeah, they fucked it up. Yes. Then, uh, oh, and by the way, there was a giant double choke slam, and Matt Morgan is a tall guy, does not take a lot of bumps. He's giant, and he did not want to take this high <laughs> choke slam. He tried to break his fall with his arm. Never do that, Oh, kids. bad idea, bad idea. Choke clips of TNA to Tokyo Dome. I'm still waiting for last year's Tokyo Dome show to air on Spike. We had AG and Kazarian chit-chatting. And after Kazarian left, and this is this is the best part, Kazarian walks off, and like one second later, Crimson appears, chokes out AJ, and tells him that they're going to be arriving in two weeks. And where did Kazarian go? Perhaps Kazarian is in fact deaf. He may be. And he's just, just a skilled maybe lip reader. Maybe he's that that uh, you know that woman from the sold out show. What? Remember the woman from the sold out oh, show? Didn't that understand anything. Yes. Didn't understand and couldn't hear. Yeah. This was just like that actually. Maybe they watched that show as well. The sold out was much worse than this. So, and by the way, why are they going to be there in two weeks? To pop a rating. <laughs> Seriously, Vince. <laughs> you have a better idea? Well, my, my, my question is, usually when someone's going to show up in two weeks, it's because there's like a big event there. The two-week mark from here is just another impact. Yes. So, are they hiking? Are they, <laughs> are they hitchhiking here or perhaps riding horses? They know from how cross country? they are trying to build to their own dramatic entrance. Mm. So... Kazarian Lethal X title, they had a final match. Nothing, nothing wrong with this. They uh, did a wacky finish where they're outside. Lethal is going to throw him into the ring. Kazarian rakes his eyes to buy himself some time. Which, again, I don't even know why they did that spot because it added nothing to the match. Because Lethal immediately went for a sunset flip inside. And Kazarian grabbed his legs, cradled him, grabbed the ropes, one, two, three. Perfectly fine for a TV match, although the, the, uh, the pointless eye rake I did not understand. And once again, the key is that the referee was Jackson James, who, you know, that's his gimmick, is that he screws up and the heels win because of it. So, this I is I want to know where the agents fine. are that, that, that talk to these guys, and when the guy goes, okay, right before the finish, he's going to throw him into the ring and I'm going to rake his eyes. Where's the agent to go, why would you do that? What does that have to do with anything? I don't know. They're not here in this promotion. That's part of the problem. I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to go easy on this episode of Impact. It went easy on me. I'm going to go easy on it. RVD Anderson and Dreamer at a meeting backstage. They do not exactly hate each other, but there was palpable tension in the air. Rob is... You're an asshole, concluded Dreamer. <laughs> well, yeah. They're, I guess that's his gimmick. It was, it was a strange bit, because yeah, yeah, Rob is still more interested in facing Jeff Hardy than he is about anything else, which I guess makes sense. He never got his revenge. But uh, they were talking about how uh, Rob is pissed because Anderson has a match with Hardy coming up, and he doesn't. And uh, RV, or Anderson said, let's just focus on beer money. And then Dreamer showed up. He said he did have a match with Jeff. He vowed to take Jeff Hardy out tonight and to soften him up for Anderson. A little redundant, don't you think? I'll say. If you take someone out, aren't they softened? So then we had uh, Jarrett and Karen coming out, and they could barely get speaking before people began loudly chanting sloppy seconds. Indeed. Jarrett said this lovely woman was a victim. That was her turn to talk. And I don't know if this was edited or, or what, but she only talked for like 10 seconds. Thank God. <laughs> From the sea rose Kurt Angle. It was a great, great visual. It was funny because as Jeff was talking, uh, you see people in the crowd looking off to one side and they all were taking pictures. And I honestly thought it was a, a fight or something. It was obviously Kurt. But yes, then we cut to a close up of the Jarrett's in the ring speaking, and you saw Angle rise slowly behind them. With a look of complete batshit insanity in his eyes. Yeah. And uh, fortunately, before uh, 
before Cameron could say too much, he grabbed Jeff, hit a big suplex, and uh, laid him out. Cameron was upset. They had a long stare down. They were just looking at each other. And there's a point here where the camera cut about 17 times in four seconds of complete inaction. Of course. Infuriating. So uh, before any much could happen, uh, Kurt got nutshotted and Jarrett beat up for a long time. Now, I hate armchair booking, but I'm going to do it right here. The goddamn cops would have come out right here and cuffed Kurt Angle and threw his ass in a cop car and took him away, and we didn't see him for the rest of the show. This would have been a ten-star angle. I gave it five stars because the heat for this angle was like, I've not seen legit heat like this in a long fucking time. This was a home run. But by the end of the show, they fucked the whole thing up. Because as great as this was, they go to commercial and they come back, and, and what's Kurt doing? He's backstage throwing shit around. Uh-huh. Yep. He should never have been seen again on this show. And no, they don't, yeah. where the fuck were the police? I just figured that part out. Oh, really? Let's hear this. In the first segment... That must have been Eric Engel. <laughs> Is that it? That's it. Kurt Where Engel, brother were Eric. the goddamn cops? They showed up at the building. They threw his ass out. Craig's proud of me. And he just came back. Yeah. And he came back and he started assaulting people. And they never came back for him. He went backstage, starts throwing shit around. Where are the authorities? This was the first time I asked this question. It was going to get worse. Pope was backstage talking to someone. He ran into uh, a fellow named B. That's what his phone said, Brian. He just called him B. So, I don't know who this man was, but he was asking Pope, do you need to sign in? Pope said, no, I need to use the computer. And B said, well, let me finish this email. Pope said, no, I need it right now. So B said, well, hold on, I'll, I'll finish and give it to you. So then Pope used his cell phone to surreptitiously call B... So B picked up the phone, couldn't hear anybody, and said, let me go somewhere where I have better reception. And as he left, Pope got on the computer. That was the end of the segment. I have no fucking idea what is happening, as usual. So there you go. He he stole the computer here. He has also stolen Kobe Kingston's hairdo. Did he steal the computer, or was he just using it? He walked away with a laptop. Hmm. It was a small laptop. You can miss it. I I presume he didn't steal it, because B would know immediately who did so. He just had to borrow it for something. I don't know what's going on. God damn it. You're not wrong about any of this. So AJ's still selling his neck in the back. You, so you missed a match here. Oh, yeah, that's right. Tommy because actually Jamer. that has to do with what I was going to yeah, say. Tommy Jamer wrestled Jeff Hardy. Jamer's back to that song where the lyric is his own name squealed in an annoying manner. Uh, he had some odd gear tonight. Taz described it as knickers. <laughs> Let me talk about this match for a second. Okay. Tommy, like a complete idiot... Takes an arm drag off the apron to the black mats for the heat. So, then he makes a comeback, not selling the fact that he took an arm drag off the fucking apron to the floor. He uh, hits his DVD, Hardy gets his feet on the ropes, Dreamer goes to uh, pick him up, Hardy snaps the ropes into his balls, and then hits a twist of fate for the pin. And it was a, a fine... Superstars style yeah. WWE match. I, uh, Absolutely nothing special. Uh, as I said in my notes here, this was okay, and okay for Impact is great. So that leads us to the AJ segment. He's still selling his neck. He got choked over an hour ago. Meanwhile, Dreamer takes an arm drag off the apron to the fucking floor, and he's fine a minute later. So Flair ices AJ, who does not want to drink this. Flair forces him to drink. He forces him to come out and party tonight. AJ is crying that it's burning my throat. I can barely breathe. So Angle flies in with a bat and kills AJ. Again, where are the fucking police? He threatens to kill Ric Flair if Jeff Jarrett is not in the ring later on tonight. Ric Flair, as usual, was the king of men here. Ric Flair was great all over the show. First of all, when he iced AJ, you've never seen Ric Flair happier. For six months, he said, I've been trying to get back at you guys for this. So he uh, went through the icing, and then Angle attacked him, and he is menacing Flair. And Flair says, I'm your biggest fan. Why are you mad at me? Enjoyed. That led to another segment a little bit later on. I'm just going to jump to this right now. Actually, I'll wait, since I want everyone to, to understand the uh, the pacing of this program. Mr. Anderson and RVD against Beer Money. 
This was a match with two great workers against the mo- two most awkward workers in all of TNA. Yes. And uh, luckily, the great workers are, in fact, great. It was fine. Heat on Anderson. There was a little bit of wackiness, but he was fine. RVD made a comeback. There actually was a moment where it looked like Jackson James was in everybody's way. And this was not heel referee stuff. This was green referee, wrong place, wrong time. But they worked around it. And RVD hit a big kick. Went up top for the splash. Rude cut him off. Uh, tried to cut him off, but was thwarted. RVD hit the splash. And then Jeff Hardy came and took the ref. So as the ref is distracted, a mystery fellow hit the ring. Who the fuck is that, I asked myself. Turns out it's Matt Hardy in street clothes. I would never have guessed without help from the announcers. So he gives Rob the twist of fate. They cut to a shot of Jeff, who looks at the referee and just goes, No, nah, I'll stop interfering. Go ahead. The ref runs back in the ring, counts the pin. They cut to a shot of Matt Hardy. I presume I was not the only one in the world who noticed that he was practically cross-eyed here. This was not his best night. <laughs> I, I I was looking more at his chins than his eyes. He's fallen off many wagons these days. Yeah. The, 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 so, yeah, so, so Rob got screwed by the Hardys and pinned here. And he's looking at the ramp, and Beer Money is celebrating, and the Hardys are laughing at him. And they could do a close-up of Rob Van Dam. You've never seen RVD look this sad. <laughs> he was heartbroken to have lost his match. Well, you know, you worked so hard. Yeah, it's all for nothing. All right, you get to do the next segment. Oh, boy! Bully Ray Dudley was backstage. Blubber Ray Dudley? Bully, Bully Ray. Oh. He was backstage. Spanky was there with him. Spanky was saying so he had a lot of anger issues. He used a lot of new ways terminology that was over my head. Something about something being out of line. He tried to teach him some deep breathing techniques. He explained you breathe in through the nose, out through the mouth. And close your eyes so you can focus on your breathing. And Ray is just staring at him like he's a complete moron. But then he tries to play along. He tries to breathe in through his nose and out through his mouth. And... Spanky says, no, no, you close your eyes more to concentrate. And so but Ray says, oh, show me one more time. And Spanky says, like this. And he takes a deep breath in. And he closes his eyes. And Ray shoves him hard against the locker. And Spanky drops out of camera view and disappears. That was it. Best impact of the year right there. Oh, goodness. I laughed hard. Well, well let's let's uh, continue then. So, right. so Spanky gets his ass kicked. Yeah. So... Then we have uh, Flair flipping his lid backstage about Angle. He's going nuts about how Angle's crazy. Something needs to be done. Apparently, calling the fucking cops back was out of the question. Yes. Keep in mind, Flair and Bishop were the ones who called the cops at the beginning of the fucking show. Perhaps, uh, you know, I don't know. They, I guess, you know. <laughs> I wouldn't think of anything silly. You call the cops, the guy comes back, you give up. That, I, mean, that's, I mean, does that not make sense? I mean, makes sense to them. Yeah, they're only allowed one phone call per day. I guess. I, I don't know. Maybe they thought that, that the uh, the person calling the cops only got one phone call, and that's a criminal. Maybe the cops in Orlando get off at 9. Could be. So they were working at 8 or at the beginning of the show, but at the end of the show, they were no longer I just had to think, if I ever want to commit a crime, uh, what, what uh, Nick Gage should have gone and committed a crime in Orlando. He'd be a free man at right 945, now. yes. Yeah. So anyway, they're screaming, everyone's screaming, I was screaming, and Flair finally told Jared to go to the ring and meet his maker. That's their solution? <laughs> well, Eric, Bischoff said, don't worry, I've got it. I've got your back. So he had a cunning plan. Devon then came out and cut a promo, and uh, Bubba came out, and despite being beaten up moments earlier, Brian Gendra comes out. Well. No. And tosses he, Bubba into the ring. He was shoved hard into a locker once. I can tell you from experience, that will not lay you out for long. <laughs> so, Devon gets stopped by security. Bubba cheap shots him. Of course, security is right fucking there for this. But Kurt Angle is uh, terroristic threats, assault, the whole nine yards, and he's still running wild in this fucking building. Yes. So then Bubba put a chair on... on uh, where did the security go, by the way, after Bubba B- cheap Bubba shot him? him. Oh, he beat them all up? Bubba beat up all the security guys. Jesus, these cops need guns or something. Well, so they uh, they beat him up. Or he uh, beat up Devon by putting a chair on his face and hitting him with a chain, causing Devon to go to convulsions. Fine angle. The, the, the uh, One of the parts that must be noted, Spanky came out and laid out, or he threw Bubba into the ring, and then in a fit of anger, he removed his wacky yoga robe and threw it down. 
He was at that point wearing his wrestling trunks, which are, of course, tight and white, and slippers. Yeah. Uncomfortable this was. <laughs> then we had the fucking main event. Angle came out for the confrontation with... Uh, Jarrett? Jarrett, yeah. And, uh, of course, Gunner and Murphy come out. Now, as Vinny noted, after all these fucking months of getting their ass handed to them by everybody, Gunner and Murphy finally win a fight, and they win a fight with Kurt, Kurt Angle. Angle. A guy who probably legitimately could have beat them both up. Yeah. Yes. Not an impact. Gunner and Murphy beat up Kurt Angle. So, they beat him up for a while, they stomp on him, and then, of course, he makes his own comeback. How many times have we seen the same fucking angle on this show? We even saw the same angle with virtually the same people. Angle at the beginning of the show was attacked by geeks, and he beat him all up. The same fucking thing happened at the end of the show. We had the same guy gets beat up, guy oh. makes his own comeback. You're assuming blah, he blah, beat blah, up blah. the cops. Huh? You're assuming he beat up the cops. He, he beat him up. In the first segment? Yeah. No, he didn't. They arrested him and let him away. I could have sworn he beat geeks up. Bottom of the show. Hold on a second. Where's my notes here? Uh, let's see. Jared's music hit. A bunch of geeks came oh out. Oh, my God. You're right. I'm sorry. He whipped their ass and dared Jared to come out. <laughs> I just forgot by the end of this. second fucking time on this show. I he take beat it back. fuckers up. Brian, you were right. I was wrong. And it may have been Gunnar Murphy. Entirely possible. So, yeah, they, they uh, he makes his own comeback. And, uh, again, where are the goddamn cops? Nowhere to be seen. So, uh, then, of course, uh, Jared comes out. And uh, and joins the fray, incapacitates Kurt. Kurt makes his own comeback, as noted. And uh, got Jarrett's back, put him in a rear naked choke. Karen runs out, screaming for help. Fortune comes in. Where the fuck were you guys? What were you doing that you could not come out at the beginning of this goddamn segment? I just like, this apparently was Eric Bischoff's cunning plan. Yeah. I will just send a dozen men out there to kick Kurt's ass. So, finally Abyss comes out on the ramp. He's got his arms outstretched like Raven. And Flair goes, come on down here and join the fun, my friend. And suddenly Abyss falls to his knees and falls face first on the ground. And in his back is the nail-covered board Janus. Yes. And behind him comes Crimson, who we're supposed to believe hit him in the back with his bar- this, this board covered with nails. And murdered him. Killed him dead. And says on February 3rd, they are coming. Which, the show would have ended here, you know, it would still have been stupid. But when he comes out and says they're coming, this causes Kurt Angle to make his own comeback again yes. for the second goddamn time in the same segment. Yes. And he beats up all of Fortune all by himself. Yes. <laughs> this is an impossible to fuck up Angle, and they're fucking it up. You have no idea what they're doing. No. The, the, so, yeah, the show uh, ended with Kurt standing tall. Can't wait for next week. Can't wait to see him get his revenge. Can't wait to see what Kurt Angle does to these dastardly fools next week. I believe week. he got his revenge at least twice in the show, maybe three times. Yeah. And the last note on this, Karen Jarrett's dress was looked like something straight out of the 80s. I believe I saw this worn once on Max Headroom TV show. So, yeah, I give the, th- uh, the show a thumbs in the middle. It was, it was not was an awful show. the best impact in a long time. Yeah, it was good one a couple of weeks ago that was pretty damn good. But, uh, yeah, they, they just, I wish they would get somebody that knew how to, to keep these angles from getting fucked up. They're, they're, they start out fine, and then they fall off a fucking cliff. Week after week after week. Just like the show itself, every fucking week. I'm going to get them quarter hours for this show. It's going to have a good first quarter, and the rating is going to plunge as the show goes on. That's what happens every fucking week. And nobody gets a clue. All right, there's your impact rant for this week. Hope everybody's happy. To the back! Kurt Angle came out to open the show. He reminded us that he is retired, even though he is on the show every week. You mean K Angle? I don't want to mess with anybody here. <laughs> they might be confused if we use these, these uh, abbreviations. Go on. He said he did everything for the people, asked them if he, he, sh- he, asked them if he should wrestle one more time. Immortal interrupted. Bischoff said, no, we don't want you to wrestle on our show anymore. You're missing a key part of this entire fucking thing. He comes out and he says he didn't want to go down this road, but he had made a vow that if he did not win at Bound for Glory, he would quit. He would retire. Yeah. The record book showed he did not win the title. He had not wrestled since. But sometimes he said, things change and a man has to do what a man has to do. So flat out he just said, I'm going back on my word. 
Yeah. That's the key to this thing. What a liar. What bullshit. <laughs> so uh, Bischoff said we don't want you to wrestle on our show anymore. He sent out everyone in the world to kick Kurt's, to kick Kurt's ass. They did. Jarrett looked on and laughed. Then Crimson ran down to make the save. Then we got a Ric Flair moment. He uh, went crazy, of course. He announced that Kurt was going to get Jarrett tonight. Yeah, brief aside, since when can Ric Flair do that? Well, he's... I mean, they're in charge. He's Bischoff's friend. Yeah. Right. Uh, Bischoff, I mean, don't give a shit. Well, actually, he did, but... So Jarrett was upset. So then Flair made the match. And I'm going to read what he said here. <laughs> this was the best thing on Impact in of all time. You got Jeff Jarrett, you and your dumbass partner, and you got beer money, and you got Kazarian. And at this point, he turned to our friends Gunnar and Murphy. And he paused for a long time. He looked at them. He paused. He said, this is a quote, You got these two guys? Who want a spot on the roster and want me to know their names? Gunner and is it Pal? You got them too. Gunner and his pal. I thought he said Yes. I thought he said Gunner and is it Pal? Like he thought perhaps Murphy's name was Pal. May as well be. So then he repeated Kazarian's name and also threw in Rob Terry. But yes, Ric Flair made it clear he does not know Gunner and Murphy's names and doesn't care about them. And why should he? That was great. You know, in my karate class, there's a kid named Murphy. Murphy. In 2011. I, I shouldn't say that. I'm sure we've got some Murphys listening. I apologize. But when you have a gunner and a Murphy, I don't know. Gunner and Murphy. Has there ever been a, a fighter named Murphy prior to this I'm that sure. didn't change his name? I'm sure somewhere in the world there's been a boxer or something. Where? they even come up with the names Gunner and Murphy? Who knows? Dude. I've got to find out where <laughs> at least Gunner is like, okay, you know, gun. It sounds violent. Yeah, but Murphy? I think of a Murphy bed. Where did that come from? There are probably a thousand drunken Irishmen in Boston named Murphy who uh, fight a lot. If they were drunken Englishmen, I believe they'd kick someone's ass. Not this fella. This Murphy. He's a loser. So backstage, Bischoff asked Flair why he booked the match. Flair acted all crazy. Mike and they told us... This Wait is a second. Talk about glossing over a fucking segment. This was the best segment of all time. This was? Flair this is... This was the previous Flair segment. Ranting and raving and just going batshit nuts. And Bischoff is, is uh, asking him, why did you do this? And Flair's screaming about how... Nobody nobody does this shit to fortune, and we need to stand up for ourselves, and we need to set a precedent. Kurt doesn't run this fucking show. And Bischoff said, this guy's a killer. And Flair screams, he can't kill ten men! And I was like, he is completely right. Flair was a thousand, one million percent right in this segment, and he was insane. This was great. Okay. A man speaking the truth. I enjoyed this first segment better. Mike Nane told us that tonight the Kurt Angle would wrestle on Impact for the first time in three months. Now that they're both over, which do you think was lamer, the Kurt Angle retirement or the John Cena quitting? Oh, God, the John Cena won by a fucking country mile. Okay. He never even missed a TV. Kurt Angle was, he did miss some impacts. There were some impacts that were angle-free, so there you go. Randy Orton missed more television than John Cena during that period. That's true. Serena and Tara and Madison versus Mickey and Angelina and Velvet Sky in an elimination match. Before the match even started, the beautiful people were about to enter. Winner cut them off to, I don't know what. Angelina told her to leave them alone that Velvet is her BFF. That's what she said. So Winter freaked out and started punching a wall. So they had the match. This match. They had, they had six women there, so the idea should be that they, they all are in the ring for a very limited period of time, a lot of quick tags, nobody can get exposed. Of course, that's not what they do. Velvet's in there forever. She looked like she was still in wrestling school. She's getting worse. I have no idea how you can be in this business for this long and, and be regressing. I, I don't understand. She's getting worse, and she's no longer satisfied to just be a horrible wrestler. She now has to also invent stupid moves. She, uh, she's like a straight jacket. Execution. Ed, yeah, whatever she calls that move. 
So anyway, they had, I swear to God, was the most embarrassing televised moment of professional wrestling that I have seen in years. Now, obviously there have been worse matches, and and there have been botched spots here and there, but the elimination series that they did in the middle of this match, what happened was, I don't even really know how to explain this, but Madison was trying to punch somebody, and somebody, none of this matters, just the, the gist of it, somebody gave her a drop toe hold, and she took a bump on her own loaded glove, which knocked her out, they said. This was not the worst part. They then proceeded to do two eliminations, and everybody was falling all over each other. There was a, I believe, Mickey Pin Madison... And by the way, Madison is a champion. She was eliminated second in elimination match. Don't even ask me why. Mickey pins her, and then Sarita runs in and does a La Mahistral cradle on Mickey, on Madison, and they're like all in a pig pile, and this is your finish. This was such a ridiculously laughable clusterfuck. Like, you would not even see this in wrestling school. You would not see people falling all over themselves like complete imbeciles like we saw in this moment here. This was so bad. And it got a little better after that because it would have to. They also took a commercial break. They had a break. They, uh, they came down to Tara, Angelina, and Sarita. It was boring. Nobody cared. And uh, she ended up pinning both of them. First she pinned Tara with the Botox injection and then a reverse rolling cradle on Sarita for the pin. Holy fuck, this was bad in the middle. And you know, I even mentioned that in the middle of this here, Velvet, who was eliminated, uh, in the second part of this match after the commercial, they cut backstage where she was like holding her head and on her hands and knees, and she tried to get up, but it hurt too bad, so she went down again, and she sold for a while, and then she tried to get up, and she went back down again, and this happened over and over for like 25 seconds. Of course. So, there you go. And they noted she never even got hit in the head. It's a phantom concussion angle. Yeah. We then had a Matt Hardy promo. He's been in the company for like two or three weeks. This is the first time he's spoken. Um, it was okay, actually. He, he talked about having cold blood running through his veins. He's cold blood Matt Hardy. Yeah. He uh, vowed that Mr. Anderson would never make it to February 3rd because he was going to take him out tonight and do his brother Jeff a favor. This is fine. He's been more lucid. He's, he's probably... He's, yeah. He's been crazier, he's been better, but this is okay. They announce that they're going to do... Oh, God. Okay, here's what's going to happen. I'll, first, I will tell you what's going to happen. They're doing a nine-man three-way tournament with the winner getting a title shot at Frankie Kazarian for the X title. So, a bunch of three-way matches. And the winner gets a title shot. They made it so much more complicated than that. They're talking about... Three men in this match. Three men next week. Three matches. They went on and on and on. They made it... It's a very, really very simple, and they made it stupidly complicated. So we had our first match. Amazing Red versus Max Buck versus Chris Saban. In a X Division number one contender qualifying tournament. That's what they called it. Yeah. We had a inset promos as the guys made their entrance. Everyone spoke for like eight seconds. I'm fine with this idea. I'm fine with the idea, but Jesus God, Max and and Red, a combined age of twenty, maybe. Yes, that's impossible to take seriously. That's why Chris. Uh, Chris. That's why Red had uh, Don West speaking for him. The Bucks must never wear this gear again. They were both wearing navy blue bell bottoms with rave green trim about them. It, it's a horrible look anyway, but. It made their legs look impossibly skinny. Just a terrible, terrible look. So they had exactly the match you would think. They all did one million moves. That's that's a lie. I never thought in my life I would see a man, in this case Jeremy DeBuck, <laughs> getting up on the apron to, to uh, distract the referee. And Red, who, as noted, appears to be approximately 10 years old, walk over and give him a forearm... And caused Jeremy Buck to take a flip bump off the apron. Yes. I would have fired him on the spot. What an exposure of the business that was right there. 
Not to mention it's just a stupid thing to do. There's one thing in the middle of the match when Chris Saban, running at top speed, hit red, and he did a, a 360 on a clothesline. That was awesome. That was 100% believable. Red hit this guy with a forearm shiver, and he did a flip bump off the apron to the floor. Yes. It's ridiculous. Yes. So aside from that, they all did one million moves. They all went back and forth. Just zip, 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 zip. And then Max Buck pinned red with the uh, elevated DDT. So after Jeremy Buck crotched red on the top rope. Correct. So And then took a flip bump off the apron. No, that was after the flip bump. Uh, prior, yeah. Yes. He, he got his revenge for the flip bump. Correct. So Red has been in the company for eight years. He uh, has been the a star of the X Division uh, off and on. He is doing jobs in first round tournament matches. His brother, Crimson, just showed up and is part of the biggest angle in the show. Of course. So be, be, be born big, everyone. Be, be tall, everyone. That's the lesson here. Then this show got insufferable for a while. We had Jeff Jarrett and Karen Jarrett bitching about Kurt Angle. They yammered. They yapped at each other. They barked. I don't care what they said. This was turn the channel heat. Oh, I yeah. could not wait for the segment to end. The level of screeching. Oh, my God. That came out of, of Karen Angle. And just the idea of these two bitching back and forth. The idea is supposed to be that that they got married and, and it's driving Kurt nuts. So you would think the idea would be that they're they're grossly, sickeningly in love. Yeah. No, they're fighting. No, Kurt, if Kurt had seen the segment, he would think, thank God. Yes. Speaking of shrieking, Velvet Sky appeared on television. She was shrieking about winter. Anthony was there. The only good thing about this segment was when Velvet said winter laid her out and gave her the concussion. Angelina said, well, maybe it was Sarita. She's a crazy Mexican, too. So she said. Those were her exact words. Yes. That was funny. The rest of this, though, Velvet Sky... Who's a worse streaker, do you think, Velvet or Karen? Well, it's kind of funny because... Karen when, is worse, but Velvet's also terrible. When Velvet came out for the segment later, Taz actually acknowledged the screeching and said that Karen, Madison, and Velvet were all screechers. This is true. Essentially talking about how infuriating this was. It's amazing how this show takes very beautiful women and makes them not even unlikable or hateable, unwatchable, mm -hmm. intolerable. Yes. That's astounding. Jeff Hardy came out. He said fans are marks and internet junkies and they don't care about him. He said he would win the belt back. This brought up Mr. Anderson. He's still carrying his shitty belt around. He made a point to note that it actually looks like Jeff. To make a long story short, he said he would win. But he was very entertaining here. He made fun of Jeff for bitching. He uh, said he was the total nonstop TNA champion. He told him nonstop asshole. And he told him nonstop champ. Everyone loved him. He was great in this segment. Whatever Jeff was wearing, you better not wear that to his trial. <laughs> he did look like a man who may have used drugs. We had a Crimson promo. He said he had, he had always been there for Red. He always would be there for Red. But he had been given an offer he cannot refuse. And we'll find out who from next week. They then showed Abyss last week with the nail-covered board sticking out of his back. Sticking out of his back. Yeah. Taz then gave us an update on Abyss, which I am not making up. This is a direct quote. He's in bad shape. <laughs> He went on to say that he has spinal cord and nerve injuries in 2011. Yeah. He had to say he's hurt. No. Spinal, spin, I guess the, the nails went into his spinal cord. And hurt he, his nerves. He missed a few weeks. <laughs> yes. Correct. Yeah. So Velvet came out to ruin my mood further. She called him winter. Not making this up. There are a lot of great quotes on this show. A glass-bottom, boat-loving Mitch. I don't what? have any idea what that means, So why that's an insult. She Glass-bottom boats are fun. I suppose. I don't know why it's so bad to love them. So she was shrieking and just driving me crazy, just being very, very loud. Winter came out to save the day and beat her up. This is the weekly women's brawl that goes on way too long. I guess Winter won... And then Angelina you came. guess? <laughs> Let me tell everyone the story of this segment. I will cut it short. Velvet, who I think is the babyface, but without a script. Who the fuck knows? I don't know. 
She did the most obnoxious promo imaginable, challenged Winter. Winter came out and handed her ass to her in a fair fight. They they were brawling, and finally Velvet was screaming that she's my partner, not yours. This caused uh, Winter to scream at her, which incapacitated her, such as, as lions do to their prey. And then she attacked her and beat her up in the ground and pound and left her unconscious, practically. And then Angelina came down, and, and the fans were so yes. into this segment <laughs> that they chanted, She's a screamer! And uh, that was the extent of the heat for this segment. That's almost word for word what I wrote down. Yes. I felt horrible for everyone involved with this. Nobody came off well. It was pure shit. <laughs> it was impact. Fortunately, the show turned around at least for one segment. Pope came out. <laughs> he announced that he was here to confess. He said most of us were, uh, most people in the crowd were sitting next to someone they didn't like but had to pretend to like them. I immediately looked at you. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> he said most people were sitting at home next to someone they couldn't stand but they were going to uh, stay married for the sake of the kids. This caused some black man in the crowd to stand up and applaud. Swear to God, if you go back, if you go back and watch this on tape, there are two black gentlemen in the crowd, and and it's impossible to miss. As soon as he says They're the right line, behind his head. as soon as he says the line about we all crawl into bed with someone we can't stand, and we justify it by saying we're doing it for the children, and these men leaped to their feet and began applauding violently. Yes, cried with laughter. They knew what this guy was talking about. Cried. I pissed myself with laughter. So. He then said he, he was not going to be like this. He was better than everyone else. So he was going to tell it like it, like it is. He took off his glasses and he said, Joe, I don't like you. <laughs> yes. He said he didn't like Joe. He didn't like what he stands for. And he asked a very good question. Who goes around in modern day society talking about, I'm going to kill you? Yeah. Now you had to see his eyes when he said this. Because... There was passion in, the, in this man's eyes. But it made it, made it plainly obvious that, you know what? Who does go around in modern-day society saying, I'm going to kill you? He talked about the fans being horrible for encouraging Joe to kill people. And uh, he said next week he's going to give one fan a chance to confess. And he left. This, this was great. This was one of those promos where, quite frankly, I have no idea what he was talking about. And and more importantly, I mean, I, I, I had a clue, obviously, but he said a lot of things I didn't understand. For example, the hook for next week is that next week on the show, we're supposed to tune in so that he can let a fan come into the ring and confess their sins to him. Right. What? I don't know. What kind know. of a fucking hook is that? I don't know. That's not Call your fault. friends, everybody. Next week on Impact, Pope is going to bring a fan from the Impact Zone into the ring, and they're going to confess their sins to him. That's a, that's a 1.4 quarter right there. <laughs> But his delivery was so great that it was awesome. Yes. And I almost can't wait. Because <laughs> Pope made it great. Pope made this great. It's like a flair promo where he just, he's incomprehensible, but he's got he such passion, great. it's awesome. Yes. Speaking of flair, he was backstage giving a pep talk to a mortal in the crew, told him to go, all, go out there and destroy Kurt and Crimson, told, you know, Governor Murphy to impress him, all that stuff. So they left, they were all fired up. Eric Young was still there, he had his belt. You want to know what happened, everybody? Flair cut the same promo on Eric Young that I would like to cut on that character every time I see him on this program. He told him to get the fuck out of this locker room. When we left, he just went, Jesus! Yes. He told him the, 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 the belt he was carrying is something we threw away. He grabbed the belt and threw it on the ground. And yes, he did, in fact, say Jesus. So they have been plugging throughout the show an appearance by Dixie Carter. Throughout the show, an appearance. Dix, yes, Dixie Carter speaks. So they come to the announce desk. Mike Tanay said, Dixie's going to join us live via the telephone. The telephone. Via Alexander Granville's listening device. Yes. The telephone. So, she addressed the legal issues with Hulk Hogan. She said they were going to win. This could not have taken ten seconds. No. This, this was... <laughs> she said, I'm very confident that next week... After we go to court, I will regain my position as the head of TNA. And that was pretty much the entire extent of the speech. And let me just say, if the storyline next week is that the case had a continuance, 
I will tell you about every bad thing I ever said about TNA. <laughs> they can redeem themselves. The case has been continued. Yes. So they got to Bischoff, who had a lot more to say. Uh, he said next week, two wrongs will be righted. He said Jeff Hardy would get his TNA title back, and that they were going to win the legal battle and maintain control of TNA. So there you go. Dave thinks that Bischoff is like the best non-wrestler around as far as his promos. I strongly disagree. But I will say that this was actually a very good promo by Eric Bischoff. He has his moments, and this is one of them. I mean, usually Eric Bischoff promos are just, he acts like an asshole. You know, you don't really, I mean, it's just like, you know, we've seen it a million times. There's no real heat. You don't really want to see anybody kick his ass. He's, you know, I, I don't know. I don't get the Eric Bischoff thing. But this was a promo where he actually cut a promo. He stated his piece. It, it, it tied into Dixie's interview. And when it was over, you thought, hmm, I wonder what's going to happen next week. That's the fucking point of a promo. Yes. So this was a good promo. So we had Matt Hardy versus Mr. Anderson. I couldn't believe this. <laughs> they had this match, and they got about three minutes, and then Mr. Anderson beat him clean. Yeah. Way to go, Matt Hardy. <laughs> Wait for a cover. Hell of a run here at TNA. Him. You are now Matt Hardy in WWE again. In, in TNA. TNA. Think about that, the, fool. The other great part about this was that you will recall when Mason Ryan uh, laid out, uh, who the hell was it, Cena or Orton or one of them, Mason Ryan used a side effect on Raw as his big move. That made me laugh. Well, this week on Impact, Matt Hardy used an FU. Which was not identified. No. <laughs> that, that's comedy to me. So Anderson won, pinned him clean. <laughs> Matt Hardy's undefeated streak ends at zero. Anderson is going up the ramp. Jeff Hardy comes in to lay him down. The brothers Hardy beat him up for a bit. RVD comes down to make the save. The key here... I've never seen RVD run so slow, by the way. He was not looking his best. You don't care. But, uh, well, that too. But RVD comes down to make the save. And there actually was a key here. As soon as he hit the ring, Jeff Hardy ran for the hills, leaving Matt to die. So Mm -hmm. Jeff Hardy is, in fact, afraid of RVD. Holy shit, they're building to something. Yeah. Once in a while, they do it. So we had our main event, Angle and Crimson versus a bunch of dudes. Jeff Jarrett was not there. Crimson got in the ring. He did the spot they practiced for a minute and immediately tagged out. Okay, he looked fine, so it worked. Uh, Angle wrestled for perhaps two minutes. They set up a ref bump from miles away. Yeah. Miles away, you can see where this is going. Ref got bumped. Bad guys came in, beat up the good guys a lot. Jarrett's music hit. He arrived and uh, got in the ring with Kurt, and he Jarrett threw a punch, and Angle was supposed to duck it. I don't know if he didn't duck low enough or Jarrett didn't know he was going to duck, but it looked like he caught Kurt in the face. But uh, Kurt shrugged it off and hit one big suplex, and he got swarmed again. So the bad guys were beating him up, who's making the save, but Matt Morgan, he ran down. He, too, was swarmed, and the lights went out. And the siren went off, and when it came in, Scott Steiner was in the ring with a, le- with a big lead pipe. He destroyed everyone, set them all packing, and the show ended. You know, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll give my criticism first, and then I'll, I'll, I'll actually praise this. <laughs> Listen, when Kurt Angle is getting beaten up by ten men, and Jeff Jarrett comes down, just have Jeff Jarrett lay him out. That, that's how you build heat. Instead... Jeff Jarrett comes down and Angle immediately, despite the fact that ten men are beating on him, Jeff Jarrett comes down and Angle is still able to duck his punch and give him a German. Why would we ever want to see this match again? Jeff is so completely impotent. He's so completely incompetent. I have no idea why you'd want to see this when you do it like that. If if Angle is just being held and, and Jarrett, like a, a coward, runs down and, and, and kicks him, you know, that's fine. He's a coward. You know, at least you have not seen him look in a one-on-one confrontation like a complete imbecile, like they did here. Now, with all that said, this was a rare incident where the last 15 minutes was the best thing on this show. That is true. They they did a, a fine job with the uh, the run-in after the uh, the Matt Hardy match, and they did a fine thing with this main event here. And I presume the next week, Dixie gets power back. There's not a continuance. Rehires Kurt Angle, and the main event mafia is back, and, and uh, that's they. 
And uh, there you go. There's your big thing. But they're they're doing a fine job building to next week. Better than they do building to pay-per-views, oh, ironically. Of course. Of course. So, uh, yeah. Um, I, I give this impact a thumbs in the middle because normally a show will be, you know, it'll be like a, a decent show early and fall off a cliff. And the last thing you remember is how shitty it was at the end. This was the opposite, where there was a lot of shit at the beginning, but they got their act together in the last 15, 20 minutes, so uh, you remember the show being not that bad at all. I will even go by the impact scale, by the impact scale, a thumbs up. Thumbs in the middle. I can't even give it a thumbs up. Did you fucking remember the middle part of the show in the beginning? All the shrieking was pretty terrible. Thumbs in the middle show here for impact.